Ashley Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Karen Chapman and Christina Solwitz are on the show today, and they're the authors of Gardening with Foliage First, 127 Dazzling Combinations that Pair the Beauty of Leaves with Flowers, Bark, Berries, and More. As landscape designers, Karen and Christina see gardens through a different lens, They like to begin their work on a garden space by building what they call the foliage framework. Now, this requires shifting your focus away from blooms, which are fleeting, and from artistic elements, which are often designed to steal your full attention. Instead, the foliage is elevated as a top priority kind of like building a quality foundation for a house. When we ignore the role of foliage, our gardens can feel like a roller coaster with a few weeks of fantastic blooms followed by an endless sea of uninspired greenery. But we can step off that crazy ride and have a more consistently wonderful experience by thoughtfully creating the right foliage palette, one that offers year-round color, texture, and interest. If you're looking for expert advice for designing a better garden this year, or if you're a designer who loves to talk shop, or if you just geek out on plant selection, you're in for a real treat today. How to Create a Foliage Framework for Your Garden with Karen Chapman and Christina Solwitz. That's the topic of today's show, and it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. Well, welcome to the show. I'd like to start out by saying thank you for listening to the Still Growing Podcast this week especially if you've just found the show. I want to welcome you and say thanks for being here. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. You know, four years ago, I stumbled on gardening podcasts, and I thought they were just such a wonderful way to grow and learn as a gardener, and I still believe that today. So at the top of every show, I try to bring new listening experiences to your attention. I was on Twitter this week, and I noticed that Francis Nesbitt had posted something about a brand new podcast coming out, and it's called The Kitchen Garden Radio Show. So I don't believe it's out just yet, but it will be here soon. So keep an eye out for that Kitchen Garden Radio Show. I'm assuming it's a radio broadcast that then gets uploaded as a podcast, and I believe it's based in Ireland. So I'm looking forward to tracking that one down. In addition, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show is starting back up. It should be this weekend. It starts March 3rd at 9 a.m. It's the only Garden Talk radio show in Milwaukee. And of course, it's available as a podcast as well. So if you're a hardcore vegetable grower, check out the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show. In any case, I'm sincerely honored that you're spending some of your time here listening to the Still Growing Podcast. And I'd also like to invite you to join the listener community for the show. It's a free private Facebook group that I created for people who listen to the show And I had a number of goals in mind when I created the group. First, you get access to all of the garden articles that I curate for you over the week. They get shared in the Garden News Roundup, but then there are a few extra gems that I put in the Facebook group just for you. Second, the Facebook group is the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any show giveaways. Last week, I had Barbara Pleasant on the show, and we were talking about her book, The Complete Houseplant Survival Manual, and the winner 
of that book is Michelle George. So congratulations, Michelle. Send me your address information and email, and I'll make sure that a copy of that book gets to you. So congratulations, Michelle. Another reason to join the group is that you get to interact with the great guests that have been on the show, like Barbara Pleasant. In fact, a listener was posting a question about something earlier this week, and Barbara replied. And that is so helpful and such a great opportunity for you to continue the conversation. So if you hear something in one of the shows and you want to ask more questions, you can certainly follow up with the expert in the group. Finally, there's no spam in the group. The content that I share with the listener community is something that I work very hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. Everything I post is curated with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Plus, it's free and easy to join. The next time you're in Facebook, just search for Still Growing Podcast Group and our group will pop up. Just request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. All right, now it's time to welcome new members who have joined the group recently. Peter Hobbs, Mark Barber, Seth Whitworth, Annette Logan, Lisa Eldred Steinkoff. Lisa was featured as a guest on the show with her new book on houseplants, which is just spectacular. Melissa Kuhnert, Annie Seifs, Robert Lung, Luke Fencebrook, Ariana Robbins, Kate Cohn, and Charlie Joseph Zicolillo. Welcome, you guys. One of the fun posts that got shared this week in the listener community was shared by Beth Engel. And it was a video that had been posted by Dave Murdoch, and it featured a North Carolina spring peeper just singing its little heart out. And Beth wrote, it's a sure harbinger of spring. So I thought I'd play a little bit of it here and you can enjoy listening to this little spring peeper just go into town. Here he is. When Dave posted that, he said he didn't care that I was there taking a video of him. It's a really, really, really cool video. So if you get in the group and you want to check it out, just type in peeper. <laughs> this post will pop right up. Before I forget, let me make sure to mention that there is a phone number for the show. You can call in with your questions, comments, suggestions, or feedback. Just dial 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. I'd love to hear your voice. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. And it's made up of a dozen different segments. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you can stay pretty informed on the news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group. So if you hear something and you want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. All right, in the guest update segment, Barbara Pleasant was replying to Dave Engel, who had asked a question about how to use row cover in the spring. And Barbara gave some good advice. Here's what she does. She uses mid-weight white row cover for her tunnels and other things in the spring. In the summer, she switches it up and she starts to use tool or sheer curtains for insect protection. That's the role that that is playing. And then finally, in late summer, she'll start to use the green shade cover fabric for more protection and to help get those fall vegetables growing. In addition to that, Barbara shared a good post that she had written called Sewing Row Covers for the Vegetable Garden. So go ahead and check that out. That's in the Facebook group as well this week. Just head on over and type in Row Cover once you're in the group and this post will pop up. 
Also in the guest update segment, listener Patricia Chandler Newport shared an article that had appeared in her local paper, and it was featuring Lisa Eldred Steinkopf back from episode 598. She was talking about houseplants with us. She's also the houseplant guru, and she opened up her home so that the newspaper could come in and do this story on her. So it was really super fun to see all of the houseplants she has around her house. I loved getting that little behind-the-scenes glimpse. That was fun. Great share, Patricia. Thank you for that. In sustainability, sitkawild.org shared a great post on potatoes. They focused on two varieties, the Klingit and Haida potatoes. But if you like reading about vegetable history, this is a fun post, and it was originally shared in Edible Alaska magazine. In continuing ed, Mother Earth Living had this post, and it was called Grow Dill and Cilantro in the Spring. They point out that after the solstice passes in late June, dill or cilantro become much less likely to burst into premature bloom. This article came about after a question that was posed by a gardener. Here was the question. I made the beginner's mistake of planting dill and cilantro as purchased seedlings, ending up with plants too spindly to produce a harvest. So last year, I sowed seed right into my garden. The direct seeded plants grew better, but they still started flowering when they were very small. What can I do to grow bushier plants? And here was the answer. Both dill and cilantro are cool season annuals with fragile taproots, so sowing in the spring is a sound practice. But to get a steady supply of either of these herbs, you need to tuck a second set of seeds into the soil a month after the first, followed by a third planting in late summer. So essentially, succession planting these herbs will give you the harvest that you're looking for. Great advice. Also in continuing ed, grass guru John Greenlee shared eight tips for a meadow garden. This was in Gardenista last year, and I've been hanging on to this article. Now's a great time to share it. If you're thinking about installing a meadow garden, read this post first. Lots of great tips here, including this one. This is one of my favorites. He said, the smaller your garden, the more a little meadow makes sense. And in a small space, a meadow is so much sexier than a lawn. You have a lot more interesting things going on in a meadow. So if you have a small space, keep the design simple. Choose a grass or grasses based on how you want to use the space. Do you want to walk across the meadow every now and again? Or do you want to use it as a lawn or mow a path through it? A couple of things to consider here, but lots of great advice from John Greenlee. In the how-to DIY segment, the English Garden out of the UK shared a post called How to Chit Seed Potatoes for an Early Crop. Essentially, you want to chit your seed potatoes about six weeks before planting time. You can't use supermarket potatoes as seed potatoes they might have been treated to prevent them from sprouting, in which case that won't work at all. But in addition to that, these types of potatoes may also be more prone to disease. So you're better off just buying seed potatoes and starting from that point. Now to chit seed potatoes, all you do is place each potato rose end up. And the rose end is just the end that has the most little dimples or eyes on it. That's the end where most of the shoots will sprout from. So you put your little potatoes in that tray, and then you put that tray in a well-lit place indoors. Then once those little shoots are about five centimeters long, they're ready to be planted. You can put them in containers or you can put them right in the ground. And don't forget, it's super easy to grow potatoes right inside straw bales. So if you haven't checked into that, head on over to Joel Karsten's Straw Bale Garden website or even go to his Facebook page and then just search for Growing Potatoes and Straw Bale Gardens. 
It's so easy. When the plant has died back on top of the straw bale, you just kick the bale over and all the potatoes fall out. It can't get much easier than that. Also in the how-to DIY segment, Higgledy Gardens shared how you can grow a cut flower garden grown completely in builder's buckets. This is a great idea. He's also got a super cute picture of his dog here. But he, and so if you're a dog lover, you got to check that out. But he has this image of his buckets with all of these gorgeous annuals growing out of them. And then under this one picture that's just beautiful, he wrote, on this side, I've let the wild grasses grow up around the buckets. So the buckets are pretty much hidden and it gives a rustic chic vibe. The sweet peas have been left to ramble down the wall. It's gorgeous. So if you're thinking about that, Go ahead and check that out. He reminds us that most annuals only need about eight inches of space for their roots. So the buckets are perfect. In the plant spotlight, Nick Maser from Pan Global Plants shared his favorite begonia, Mexican bee nigricans. This is a rich, dark begonia with beautifully edged leaves. So if you're a begonia lover check out Nigricans. Also in the plant spotlight is the plant of the year. This was announced by the Garden Club of America and their choice for 2018 is Mountain Mint. Mountain Mint is a native perennial. Bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, moths, insects all go crazy for Mountain Mint. Now, of course, since it's in the mint family, you have to pay attention to things like spreading. It blooms from July through September. This mint is an upright clump of mint that can grow from two to three feet high. Now, mountain mint can be grown in zones four to eight in full sun to partial shade. And it also helps with erosion control, of course, with those mint roots. And don't forget, because it's so aromatic, it's not appealing to many pests like deer, rabbits, or insects. So consider adding mountain mint to your 2018 garden. It's worth mentioning that in the honorable mention category was false Solomon seal. This one is a woodland plant. It's a natural colonizer. And of course, anytime I hear woodland, I start thinking shade or partial shade. This one's a spring bloomer, so you're not going to have a ton of color from it, but it does offer up some berries later in the season, so that's a nice feature. Now, speaking of mountain mint, the Virginian Pilot, a newspaper out of Virginia, featured an article by Mary Reed Barrow, and it was all about mountain mint, and the title was, Mountain Mint in the Garden Gives Pollinators a Sweet Drink Through the Summer and Beyond. This was an article that Mary wrote in recognition of the Garden Club of America selecting mountain mint as the plant of the year. And I love what she wrote here. She said, if pollinators could vote for their plant of the year, they would vote wings down for mountain mint. And she goes on to quote Tom Hauser, senior horticulturist on the Woody's team at Norfolk Botanical Garden. He also oversees the native plant gardens there and has been a fan of mountain mint for years. And she's quoted him as saying this, the thing I like best about mountain mint is the fact that it does draw such an amazing diversity of pollinators and other insects, especially wasps and flies. The level of activity around this plant on a sunny day when it's in full bloom is incredible. There's literally a cloud of insects moving in and around the top of it. Then the article goes on to state that another vote for Mountain Mint would have come from Botanical Garden volunteer Stuart McClausland. McClausland conducted an insect survey last summer in the Native Plant Pollinator Garden. He compiled a detailed report called Relative Abundance of Potential Pollinators of a Few Native Virginia Plants. Using his data, 
McCausland deduced that 130 species of insects visited the garden and that mountain mint won the blue ribbon for the most popular native plant in the garden. So there you go, a couple of extra endorsements for the plant of the year, mountain mint. There were a number of fun articles that made the news this week. The first is a post from Alabama A a one-in-a-million yellow cardinal was spotted. Auburn University researchers showed this picture of a bright yellow cardinal. Instead of the traditional red, this one has the brilliant yellow of a finch. And it's apparently due to a rare genetic mutation. In fact, I wouldn't believe it unless I'd seen it. And this picture, taken by Jeremy Black, near Alabaster, Alabama, of this yellow cardinal is spectacular. Now, what's been fun about this is that people around Alabaster, Alabama, have been seeing this cardinal. One of the residents, Charlie Stevenson, noticed the unusual bird at her backyard feeder, and she thought, well, there's a bird I've never seen before. And then she gradually began to realize that what she was looking at was a cardinal. It was a yellow cardinal. If you read this article, embedded in the post is a video that Stevenson took of the yellow cardinal that she spotted in her backyard in Alabaster, Alabama. Very cool. Also in the news, there was a picture posted by Slam Magazine of Marcus Morris wearing the floral LeBron 15s at the garden, Madison Square Garden. So in honor of that, he wore his floral LeBrons. I didn't even know they made such a thing, but I showed the boys, and of course, they loved them. I thought it was hilarious. So I had to share. I said, if you're wondering what to get on Mother's Day and you're a basketball player, there you go, your floral LeBron 15s. An article written by Kate Bradbury was shared in The Telegraph, and it was called Why Dandelions Are the Heroes of Spring and Deserve a Place in Your Garden. Kate makes the case for dandelions, and here's what she says. Dandelions are wonderful because they're part of nature's calendar. A cheerful spring yellow, they tell us summer is on the way. They remind us of childhood, of blowing dandelion clocks. But most importantly, they're an essential source of food for insects that's so desperately needed at this time of year. Dandelion pollen isn't particularly nutritious compared to that of clover and vetches, but it's available when little else is about. Then finally in the news, there was this article about Elon Musk's brother. His name is Kimball, and he has embarked on a project that's significant in its own way. He's trying to reboot the food system. He's the co-founder of Square Roots, an urban farming incubator with the goal of teaching young people how to farm in cities while preaching the importance of locally sourced, non-processed food. So there was a nice article about him that was featured in the Financial Review in January of last year. That piece probably has the most comprehensive information on this venture that he started. So what they did is they set up 10 steel shipping container farms where these young entrepreneurs come in and then they develop their own vertical farming startups. They do everything under LED lights. And not surprisingly, when they had to pick 10 young entrepreneurs, they were selecting from over 500 applications. In fact, some of the folks that they selected to run these farms had never farmed or gardened before. One in particular, this gentleman named Josh Aliber, who was just 24 years old, started his own specialty herb business thanks to running his own vertical farm. The vision for Square Roots is to expand to 20 cities by 2020. So very interesting, Elon Musk's brother, Kimball Musk, with his food revolution. In the Dream Guest segment, Civil Eats featured an article that was all about a farmer named Larry Kandarian. And the title of it was How a Grain and Legume Farmer Harvests Nutrition from the Soil. And if you haven't guessed already, Larry is a master at cover cropping. Here's what it said. 
For fertility, Kandarian takes advantage of the nitrogen-fixing properties of plants in the legume family, like clover, beans, and sweet pea. He sows legume seeds in the ground after the grain is harvested, leaving the chaff of the grains still on the field. The chaff decomposes and fertilizes the legume crop. That cover crop fixes nitrogen into the soil. Anyway, it was a lovely article on Larry. He sounds like a great guy, and he certainly knows what he's talking about. He produces up to 30 varieties of grains every year that total up to 50,000 pounds every growing season. And he grows everything from buckwheat and barley to amaranth and white Sonora wheat. In addition to einkorn, which Kandarian pointed out is the oldest grain in history. So that's why Larry Kandarian made the Dream Guest segment this week. In science, Boing Boing shared a great post about flowers from a bug's perspective. And the title of it is, Flowers Look Way More Beautiful If You're a Bug. And to prove the point, the pictures that they shared were showing blooms in ultraviolet-induced visible fluorescence, the way insects would see these flowers, and they're quite stunning. So there's a picture of String of Pearls, a simple Shasta daisy, which looks incredible photographed this way, and then even the hawthorn. And the photographer commented that for how frequently Indian hawthorn seems to bloom in my area, it's amazing I haven't photographed it until now. And this picture is gorgeous. Love that article. There was also a great article on how guard bees fight. It was featured in the Hindu.com. They called it Sting Theory, how guard bees fight so fiercely when attacked. It turns out that the alarm pheromone increases the level of serotonin and dopamine in the bee brain, which in turn increases the stinging behavior in bees, and that's how they repel a threat. So they pick up on that sense of alarm, and they can't help but be triggered by that. So there you go. In shopping this week, here's a great little tip for you. There's a book called The Salad Garden. It's by Joy Larcom. It's a guide to growing more than 200 salad plants. You get information on planting techniques, advice on the best varieties for growing and for flavor, and plenty of tips and tricks for bountiful crops. Plus, Joy will show you how to create a beautiful potager garden with tips on training tomatoes, planting for height, and edible seed pods. And here's the best part. You can get this book right now on Amazon for just $3.63. That's insane. If you click on the link that I provide in the Still Growing Podcast group, you can also help support the show, The Salad Garden by Joy Larcom. So check that out when you get a chance. In inspiration this week, Back to Nature on Twitter featured an adorable picture of an orange and white red squirrel. You got to check that little guy out. You might change how you feel about them if they were all as cute as this little guy. I also shared a post that was written by Chloe Dalglish. She had retweeted something from Meadow in My Garden. It was a beautiful picture pointing out that there are approximately 2 million acres of private garden in the UK that could be turned into mini nature reserves. And Chloe upped the ante a bit when she said, if everyone in the UK gardened for wildlife, the area transformed would far exceed the nature reserves we currently have. I couldn't agree more. And then she ends with this. Do something this spring. Rewild your garden. Connect new habitat. Discover new species. Very inspiring. And then finally, Mandy Can You Dig It shared on Instagram this adorable little picture of a Japanese quince that looked amazingly like a little yellow canary. That blew people away. She wrote, is it me? Or does this weird little Japanese quince look like a canary? Oh yeah, it definitely looked like a canary. Uncannily like a canary. But um bum Okay. 
in quotables this week. I decided to focus on design quotables in honor of speaking with Karen Chapman and Christina Solwitz. So here we go. A few quotes on design. Ooh, here's a good one from Penelope Hobhouse from A Gardener's Journal, 1997. Restraint is a fundamental principle of good gardening. Simplicity brings a sense of calm, whereas too many ideas and too much variety creates a sense of restlessness. There's that foliage framework calming us down. Here we go. Here's a great one from Jeff Cox, reinforcing what we're talking about today. From his work, Creating a Garden for the Senses, 1993. Too often, gardeners focus solely on flower color, allowing the greens to occur haphazardly. But green is the color that pulls everything together and deserves to be planned. Here's a fun one from Harold Nicholson, an English author. Vita refuses to abide by our decision or to remove the miserable little trees which stand in the way of my design. The romantic temperament, as usual, obstructing the classic. (laughs) Here's one from W.S. Merwin. It's a jungle out there. House and Garden, March 1997. Obviously, a garden is not the wilderness, but an assembly of shapes, most of them living, that owes some share of its composition, its appearance, to human design and effort, human conventions and convenience, and the human pursuit of that elusive, indefinable harmony that we call beauty. It has a life of its own, an intricate, willful, secret life, as any gardener knows. It is only the humans in it who think of it as a garden. But a garden is a relation, which is one of the countless reasons why it is never finished. Hmm, Like that one. Okay, two left. Here we go. This one's from Adam Levine, Zone Envy, Garden Design, April 1999. Compared to designers and other fields, gardeners have a trickier time succeeding on a visual level since our building blocks are alive with schedules and needs that might not fit a particular decorating scheme. And then finally, this anonymous anecdote told of Capability Brown, an 18th century landscape designer. So this is two people talking. Mr. Brown, I very earnestly desire that I may die before you. Why so? Because I should like to see heaven before you have improved it. Little zinger there. Well, that's the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show, how to create a foliage framework for your garden with Karen Chapman and Christina Solwitz. Over the years, Karen and Christina have designed hundreds of gardens. The two met at an event where Christina was presenting on interesting foliage combinations. Karen was sitting in the audience, and she felt an immediate connection because Christina's work was so aligned with her own. They both appreciate unique and interesting and even uncommon plant combinations, and they quickly realized realized that they had been traveling parallel paths as designers and writers. They were true horticultural kindred spirits. So their collaboration on Foliage First was a natural output of their connection. 
I mentioned at the top of the show that Karen and Christina are passionate about something they call the foliage framework. This is their starting point for designing a garden, and they know that it requires a little bit of discipline, a little bit of focus, and lots of practice. Instead of focusing on the shiny objects, blooms, or artistic elements, Karen and Christina know that the best foundation for a garden begins with foliage. Well-planned gardens feature foliage that offers year-round color, texture, and interest. Add in blooms and art, and you have a lovely garden. Karen and Christina's book, is expertly organized with color-coded pages by season, spring and summer, fall and winter, and then also by exposure, shade, or sun. And you know, quality book layout is a whole nother skill, and it's been expertly applied to Karen and Christina's material. And that makes it super handy and very easy to use. What's it like when you get two designers on the phone and you start talking plants? Nirvana. We are geeking out today, big time. Let's learn how to create a foliage framework for your garden with Karen Chapman and Christina Solwitz. Well, Karen Chapman and Christina Solwitz, welcome to the Still Growing Podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. You guys are co-authors. You've written a number of books together. How did the two of you come to write together? It was actually quite funny. Um, This is Karen here. I'm the British half of of this duo. And uh, we met at a horticultural event which was put on by Proven Winners, our well-known plant growers. Christina was doing a talk and showing some slides of really interesting foliage combinations. But what fascinated me was that I had those same combinations in my garden, and they weren't common plants. And so when she'd finished doing the talk, I went up to her and introduced myself, and we just laughed because we realized that we had been traveling parallel paths for years as designers, aspiring writers, and uh, we just knew together we could make great things happen writing books. So you gals were living basically similar gardening lives, even yeah, though you'd definitely. never connected. Yeah, it was so interesting. Yeah, very much. I was nervous with Sharon's British accent. <laughs> now, I can pronounce anything and people believe me just because it's with a British accent. I get away with all sorts. Oh, that's great. <laughs> So, Christina, you were giving a presentation that day? Yeah, I was doing a big, uh, juicy, photograph-heavy PowerPoint with a whole bunch of my photographs, you know, showing basically the the similar idea that Karen and I went on to refine and introduce to the rest of the world. That's amazing. Well, and you gals, this is your second book together, is that right? That's right. Yeah, our first book um, was Fine Foliage, and that was the top award from the Garden Writers Association for the best gardening book published that year. So we were thrilled. This is our latest book just out, Gardening with Foliage First, is with Timber Press and was released at the beginning of 2017 and has been heralded by the Royal Horticultural Society, which means a great deal to me personally as well as doing extremely well on this side of the Atlantic. I have to say, I admire the questions that you pose on the back of this book. It's got a beautiful picture on the front, Gardening with Foliage First. And then on the back, it asks these intriguing questions. It says, what happens to your yard when it's not in flower? Does it suddenly become a sea of green? You suggest that with the right foliage palette, a garden could shine with color and texture year round. And this was really the mission of your book, helping people with foliage. And it's no small task. So I thought it would be insightful and helpful to kind of set the stage a little bit by talking about flower bias, or as you call it, the floral seduction in the introduction of your book, the tendency of people to be drawn to the flowers, which are fleeting, 
and not to foliage, which is obviously longer lasting. So Karen and I have a funny saying that we use at all of our talks all the time, and we say, flowers are fleeting and foliage is forever. And it's just kind of a funny, you know, cute alliteration to get people thinking a little bit. And so the way that Karen and I like to explain it is kind of like cooking. You know, you wouldn't go to the grocery store and you've got this recipe in mind and you know visually in your brain how you want it to turn out and how it's going to look, just like in the magazine. But you went without a list of ingredients. And so you just go into the grocery store and you just start sort of picking the things that you're drawn to first. And for the majority of people, they tend to just naturally gravitate towards flowers. It's just a common impulse. And so you grab one of these and one of these and one of these. And then you get home and you have this pretty collection of flowers, but you don't really have a recipe that translates into a full-fledged meal that, that makes sense. And so it's just a kaleidoscope and there's no real sense of cohesion or good design. And so then what happens inevitably is all those flowers start to fade and, you know, like plastic is the, the mums and fall that, you know, draw you in for 10 straight days and all of a sudden they're gone and they're just a pile of mush and you have, you don't have anything left. And so we, we decided to, you know, make the emphasis on plants that are not only individually good looking, but that look good together. You know, you have to have that recipe that where this seasoning plays off of this and this textural quality makes sense. You have the right sweet note, sour note, crunchy, spicy, whatever it is that you're going for. So that when your flowers are blooming, that you have this beautiful set of plants that support the bloom and enhance it, not uh, you know, that, that make a full, beautiful display and that makes sense. So you, you end up with a, a unified, well-designed look. And it's much more attractive when you start with great-looking foliage first. Well, I love what you say there. And I also was thinking as you were telling us about this, it's very interesting to talk to people or observe people buying flowers. Oftentimes they're thinking about the flower in isolation and you're really encouraging people to think about the the combination that the setting that you're going to be putting your selections into exactly because in our first book fine foliage we didn't use any of what we call the supporting players which would be the the flower thorns berries twigs arch rock whatever those next level items are we just focused strictly on foliage combination. And in this particular book, we took the next step. So now here, let's add in a flower uh, or two or beautiful twigs or beautiful thorns or berries so that you understand how these things relate to one another. And that's really how we work as designers. That's how we design our own gardens. It's how we design our clients' gardens is we, we build that foliage framework and then we layer in the other elements into that scene. And when you're working with your clients in real life, what is the reaction to that? You know, ultimately they trust us. By the time they hire mm -hmm. us, they've trusted us. They, they've researched what we've done. They've looked at pictures either online or in, you know, photograph albums, whatever. They, they, they know what we do. They've invariably got our books. And so there's an enormous sense of trust there. Um, you know, I'll also bring clients out to my own garden and they'll just sit and absorb what they see and say, yes, now I understand this. Um, that's what I want. And so it's that, that visual link. Yeah. Right. This is Christina. I, you know, and one thing I would add to that that I do with my clients is kind of a super simple exercise. And it really kind of brings that light bulb moment on for them is that I say, okay, let's start out by why don't you tell me what colors you absolutely just abhor. Like you never, ever, ever want to have this particular color in your garden. It just makes you sad or angry or unhappy or whatever. And then we talk about, okay, well, what colors do you love? And inevitably, I'd say 95% of the time, I will stop them as soon as they're done listing all these colors and they've been talking about flowers the entire time. And they don't even realize it. And then I say, okay, so it sounds to me like you're really referring to flower color 
And and then they'll stop and they'll go, oh my gosh, you're right. I didn't even consider that. So, you know, then the next step is to say, how do you feel about that same idea in on the 30th of January? Let's talk about where your color comes from at that point. And then you see the light bulb really come on with them and they start to get it. That's great. Yeah, there's that flower bias at work right in front of you. Yeah, right. It's always good to, if you can help someone have that moment of self-discovery, that always to me feels like it's so much more long-lasting, so much more impactful than just telling them, hey, don't forget about foliage. Absolutely. And it applies to whether you're designing containers or whether you're designing gardens and whether it's a tiny patio garden or an acreage, the principle cross all those genres. One of the things I have to tip my hat to you guys on is how you've organized your book because it is super easy to navigate your book once you figure out the little system that you created. It is color-coded on the edges of the pages, something I thought was totally genius. It's green for spring and summer and then orange for fall and winter. What you did is you took that one step further, of course, and you have a dark and a light shade, which helps people identify the combinations of plants that prefer shade and the ones that prefer sun. And I just fell in love with that. I love this way to organize. How did you guys come up with that? (laughs) Well... I I know I drive Christina nuts because I am ridiculously organized as a person. And I know I drive her nuts. I probably drive everybody else nuts as well. But I am just that type A plus personality. And so, you know, if somebody says jump this high, I want to make sure I can jump higher than that. And so to me personally, you know, I just like books that are well laid out and organized. Um, and our first book, we had the same idea. It was color coded, albeit they, they didn't do it on the edges of the pages, but we did color code the uh, sections of the book. Um, this was again just a natural progression. Let's make this clearer. Let's make it easy for people to navigate, for beginners to be able to quickly find the space. It's a book that you can dip into, um, one page at a time, or you can take it to bed and you can read through a whole section. But to me, there's no reason for it not to be well-organized, right? That's just what we do. (laughs) Yeah, it was extremely well done. Before we get into it, I know we're going to talk about a lot of different plants here that you guys have used and love. I just have to have you introduce us to the way that you approach gardening, and that is a foliage framework. So the foliage framework is a way to think about when you're creating that recipe, you know, how or are you going to go shop for things? And so are you going to be shopping for things that are going to be, you know, maybe let's say the the law of threes is one of the ways that I think about it, or the rule of threes. And so I always explain it to my clients for three heights, three textures, and three colors. And so sometimes that might be you know, a twiggy thing, maybe a broadleaf thing, and then maybe something low and perennial or fluffy or whatever the case may be. And so when you have that foundational idea going into what you're you're designing for, whether it's a container, a small space, or a larger landscape, that really helps you to kind of figure out your direction a little bit faster and easier. And so it's kind of, it kind of reminds me of the old-fashioned, you know, container design rule with filler, thriller, or thriller, filler, filler. Um, it's the same idea in the garden. When you choose things, you know, you want to choose maybe a tree that's going to be that complete and total eye-catching thing that's going to draw you into the landscape. And then you're going to fill in with the fluffy bits around the skirt of the tree. And then you're going to fill in with some some third thing that's going to give you a different flavor and texture. So it's pretty straightforward identifying the framework depending on what you're doing as long as you kind of stick to some certain guidelines. Yeah, we we use three terms to help people become better um, at design, more confident with the design. And the three terms we use are spotlight, highlight, and limelight. 
And we talked earlier about how we tend to gravitate towards those colorful flowers in the nursery. And I challenge folks to imagine themselves back in the nursery, but this time to scan the table and to pick out an interesting foliage, something that draws their, their eye, and to put that foliage under an imaginary spotlight. So, I mean, let's take an easy example, the Cana Tropicana. Um, gorgeous big tropical leaf, which at face value is kind of an orangey color. But actually, when you put a light behind it, suddenly all these other colors are revealed and you begin to see shades of rose and coral and orange. There's pale yellow, there's deep green, there's even an indigo in there. And each one of those colors that you identify is actually your springboard for introducing other plant partners in the step two, which is highlight. And what we do in step two of the design process is to find a second plant which will highlight something that we have discovered when that first plant was under our spotlight. So if we saw an indigo blue in that canna, I might be looking at another blue leaf uh, tone that I can put next to that first leaf to showcase it. And then the final part of the, the design piece is limelight, um, or sometimes I call that party time, because it's where you could continue to develop the colors that you've started. You could continue those color echoes, um, adding interesting contrasts of texture and form, or you can just throw in a wild card. So you might have been building a color scheme, for example, that's all purples and golds, and then you suddenly throw in a bright orange flower just to wake it up a little bit. Um, or you might be doing a tropical design and then you choose to add in a woodland fern, an unexpected style. And those simple steps um, are really what are going to take you from a predictable design to something extraordinary and memorable. I love that. So spotlight, highlight. And limelight. And limelight. I'm mm -hmm. I'm keeping this out. And as we go through your book, I know we'll be talking about different plant combinations. Let's make sure to point those out to folks as you're sharing some of these examples with us. I think that'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What's the reaction when you share this with other designers? It's again, it's that light bulb moment because the beauty of this is that you don't have to be a designer to understand this. You don't need to be an artist. You don't need to be a horticulturalist. You don't have to be able to pronounce the plant names. It just comes down to your observation. Observation of color, of a particular shape. Um, observation if a, if a leaf is shiny or if it's matte. Um, it's something any one of us can do. I always tell people it's, it's just like picking out an outfit in the department store. You know, you're going to be dragging your little carts around the nursery. And so why not try plants on? one, two, three, that fit these elements and see if your recipe works, you know, then maybe switch something out and see if you're heading in the right direction. But unless you're trying things on together and experimenting, you don't necessarily get those beautiful, wonderful, amazing, happy accidents that can happen from trying that. And so with, with other designers, I think that we've given them a little bit of permission to not be quite so responsible restricted and regimented about how they're going about their design work as well. I like that. I tell you what, you guys, literally right as I'm recording this with you, I've got five guys in my house painting parts of my house. We've been here about 20 years and it's time. My oldest is graduating. And as someone who has just gone through the agony of picking paint colors, <laughs> um, <laughs> may I just say, Karen, as you were talking about Spotlight, I'm going... You know what? That's the spotlight skill right there. It really is. You have to, when you're looking at paint, you really have to do exactly what you're talking about. You have to kind of put it under the microscope and say, is there, are there blues in this? Is this going to come off as yellow? But that's really what you're asking people to do is just be a little bit more observant, a little more studied in what they're yeah. picking out. That's right. Exactly. And, and you know, one of the things I always tell people in my talks is that well, men can see around 300,000 colors, which is amazing when you're standing in the paint aisle trying to decipher, you know, the six different shades of white you're looking at. And, <laughs> you know, you're standing there saying, it's off-white. And he's like, I don't know. They're all white to me. Just pick one, <laughs> you know. 
But the thing is, is that women can determine up to 3 million colors. And so there is a vast difference depending on whether you're male or female, how you're going to see and interpret those colors, where you're located in the country, um, even down to your eye and hair color. There's so much that goes into it. But But the best thing is just to be observant and just try things. Yeah. It is that nuance of color as well, isn't it? It's it's identifying, you know, or just looking and thinking, is it a dark green? Is it a bright emerald green? Is yeah. it more gold in it? Because when you observe those subtle nuances, you begin to put plant partners together in a far more strategic way. And it's really fun as well as exciting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's something anybody can do. Mm-hmm. When I am picking colors or things that I want to do for my house, I'm a voracious magazine reader (laughs) and I will tear out, you know, pictures of things that I want to try or emulate. Do you guys recommend that or do you actually do that when you're out and about looking at plant combinations? Do you see something and then capture it either on your phone or in some way so that you get better at figuring out, oh, I like this combination. This is what appeals to me. Is that how you guys get better at it? Play I read it. Yeah, oh, yeah. We both just play at the nursery. We put stuff on the cart and we wheel it around and we wheel it around some more and we put things on the cart next to it and discard them and pick up something else. And Yeah, and then this is Christina. And plus, I'm forever looking on, you know, social media, Pinterest and Facebook and, you know, all over the place and other, other books and marketing things and looking at really how I can tweak that idea that somebody else gave me and make it more my own. But holy cow, I'm not above stealing an idea. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers to that. (laughs) Well, there was one plant you devoted a page to in the introduction of your book. It's the Hookera Hot List. I love that you did this. It's courtesy of Dan Himes, president of Terra Nova Nurseries. I say, make the case for Hookera for a gardener who is unfamiliar with it or underappreciates it. Right. So this was a, a funny situation for us because we got done doing so much of the book. I, I mean, I'm trying to remember. I think we were maybe three quarters of the way through or something like that. When we both kind of came to the realization, you know, oh my gosh, we have a lot of hookra in this book. And part of it is that we fully, fully realize that we are completely spoiled here in the Pacific Northwest. And so it's not lost on us that we kind of live smack in the middle of plant mecca from the, you know, the the zone of range of plants that we can grow here year round um, that other places in the country can't necessarily grow. But we found that the hookara or hookarella both are so foundational to all of our design work that we do here. We really had to devote some special interest to it just because we mention it so many times in the book. And we don't want to get penalized for the fact that we live in this, you know, haven where we can grow all these fantastic, amazing plants. (laughs) But we wanted to show people that there are options even within the world of hookara that, you know, some are going to be hardier, some may be less hardy depending on where you live. And you kind of have to make some decisions. So we went straight to the source and we asked Sandheim, hey, if somebody has issues with certain of these hookahs that we're talking about, can you give options to the reader so that they can go look for these other styles and still have or try or, or use a hookah that might get them really, really excited about foliage? And so he was kind enough to help us with this and put this together. And The thing about hookara and hookarella both is that your options in that plant category are exploding year after year. I mean, 20, 25 years ago, when we first started using hookara, you would never have found the the amazing, vibrant purple tones that we have now or really intense red. I mean, it was a much more limited palette. And so when it comes to foliage, that's a plant is one of our loves. And so we wanted to make sure that he gave options for other parts of the country where they could have some that were hardier. Then we also, you know, are open to people using substitutes for hookah if they don't want to. But we do encourage people in some of the colder climates or what have you that 
you know, it might just be worth it to consider. If this super is going to be an annual for you, consider it. Consider being okay with having a fullest plant as just an annual. And you might spend a few more dollars on it than you would on a mom, but it might just be worth it. And so we want people to really take a look at it and think about it. Just to tag on to that, Christina, what we actually did with Dan's help was break that hot list down into varieties that were best suited for the humid south. Um, for the Pacific Northwest, which actually translates very nicely to the United Kingdom at large, um, as well as the Midwest, which is particularly cold. We also then added in some additional comments, which Dan was including, you know, to tell us if it was a particular compact variety, for example, or if it had a very metallic sheen to the leaves. We really tried to help the reader get some good design and cultural information from that hot list. I think hookara is a great plant, but oftentimes when I speak to new gardeners about hookara, they're just not so sure about it. Why should they fall in love with it? Why should they be maybe a little more greedy, a little more excited when it comes to hookara? What do you guys love about this plant other than the color? Well, color is well, I mean, a big one, but I mean, I think yeah. the fact it's a bold foliage as well, you know, it's, it can be hard to find that larger leaf that's such a vivid color. What about you, Christina? You have on certain hookera, the, the or hookerella, the flowers are phenomenally long blooming and the hummingbirds absolutely love them. So I always say to somebody, you know, look, uh, what more can I give you? You have this gorgeous leaf with this absolutely fantastic veining. You have flowers. You have hummingbirds. I mean, that's a trifecta in a plant for a few dollars right there. I don't know what more I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Once you explain it or show it side by side with something in a photo, they get super excited. Yeah. It's almost like having a perennial coleus. You know, for a new a new gardener, that might be the easiest way to visualize it. Oh. That's, that's what it's giving you. Yeah, I like that. That's a great way to look at it. When you're working with hookera, do you tend to plant in mass? Like, are you? Do you have a rule? Like, I never plant one alone. I always plant in certain groups. How do you tend to use them when you're working with them? I mean, I think most of us stick mostly with perennials. We're using them in containers. As it might certainly, it's my primary use is in containers. But I have deer. I have Way more deer than anybody needs to have in their garden. <laughs> They're standing looking at me as I'm talking to you on the phone, knowing that I can't go out and chase them. Um, so, yeah. So the deer and heuchera are not an ideal combination. So I, I stick to just containers. Do you use them in the landscape, Christina? Well, uh, only where there's no deer or, or rabbit. Right. And that is far and few between. But, I mean, I did just use them in a mass planting earlier this fall with some hostas. And, the, and this person is, oh, I don't know if urban is the right word, right. but there's no deer and bunnies. And so... It was absolutely glorious because it was a beautiful russet red tone with white variegated hostas planted in mass, and it was gorgeous. But I do tend to use them a lot in containers as well. So I go back and forth depending on the situation. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have to say, before we go through some of the really beautiful examples of foliage first design in your book, we need to chat a little bit about substitutions because sometimes your combinations that you suggest won't be able to be copied verbatim in some gardens. But gardeners who read this book can take cues from the combinations you've put together and they can replace it with excellent substitutions. And I'm thinking here of an image that Pam Pennick, the author of the blog Digging, had shared when she reviewed your book. She gardens in Texas and she showed one page and she fell in love with the combination. And then she had made all these little notes in the margin. Okay, I'm going to substitute this because this will be more appropriate for my Texas garden. That's really, I guess, the goal here is that people look at these combinations. Yes, some of the plants are going to work just fine in your garden, in your zone. But if they don't, don't freak out. Just move some things around, right? That's right. Exactly. So, yeah, substitutions can be needed for, you know, several different reasons. It can be that you're in a different climate. So I will point out that Christina and I photographed gardens right across the country um, for the book. 
Um, you may need to make substitution because, like me, you have deer. Um, it might be a plant which is invasive in your area or just purely personal preference. So what we invite readers to do is to look at the characteristics of the particular plant they're wanting to substitute. So are you looking for leaf which is purple? Are you trying to recreate that velvety texture or a particular shape? Um, and then look for something which is comparable that um, you can use. So, for example, if you're an East Coast listener and um, trying to avoid barberries because they're invasive there, you might want to substitute, say, a Wigila or Laura Petalum or even one of the nine barks. Um, so that's how we, we work it in. Yeah. And, you know, lately I have seen people post on social media, they'll fall in love with a picture and they'll say, okay, I can't grow this one in my area. What would you recommend? And the suggestions from people in that zone are incredible. I'm I, I'm surprised. We can do group design here now online with thanks to the internet. Right. It's so true. You know, I, I always harken back in this concept of, you know, making substitutions in a design idea. The, the, the famous chef who lives right here in our area, Graham Care, the Galloping Gourmet, he had said once that, you know, this recipe is simply a springboard. This is for you to spring from this idea and make it your own. You know, we, we're giving you just the, the basic recipe of an idea, and we want you to get creative with it, and we want you to take it and make it perfect for your landscape so that it works for you. That's exactly right. Well, let's go through some of the combinations that you highlight in your book. What I love about how you did this is you give us a wide shot of the combination, and then you give us close-ups of each plant, of each plant that's in that combination. And along the way, what's happening is the reader will begin to learn how to appreciate individual plants as well as plants in combination with each other, which is what you were talking about at the beginning, how we shop, how we tend to shop for plants. So yes, do the spotlight, look at them individually, but then put them together and imagine them supporting each other in combination. What I thought we would do is go through some of these. We're going to start out in the spring and summer section of your book, and we're going to look at a few of these a little bit more closely. Let's start out with this first one you guys call smoke signals. So we've got the grace smoke bush that zones five through nine. And then you paired it with the red leaf rose, the Rosa Glauca that you've talked about. That's zones two through eight. That's beautiful. I love that one. Yeah. So smoke signals is such a neat one because this is such an excellent example of a combination of only two plants that we're discussing, but with a huge, huge, huge amount of personality and seasonality. And so, you know, one of the things that the publisher had asked us to do when we were designing the framework was to describe the, the broad shot, but then talk about how this design is going to grow and change and go further. And this particular combination with a gray smoke bush, Catinus grace, and then with the red leaf rose or Rosa Glauca is such an example of this. It's fantastic. So this gray smoke bush, which if you've never grown grace, if you've only grown, say, like royal purple or some of the green cultivars, this particular one is a serious winner, winner chicken dinner. It's one of our absolute favorites. And so you get this beautiful kind of a smoky purple subtle color in the spring and summer and even sort of a soft plum and you get, sometimes you'll even get a little hint of coral and whatnot. But then when you're looking at those giant leaves against this Rosa Glauca or this red leaf rose, the rose has a beautiful almost blue foliage, which is what Glauca means in botanical Latin. And so you get this blue foliage and this red foliage together, which are really striking. You have the large leaf and the small leaf together, which is great textural contrast. But as this goes into fall, you get this spectacular color change on that gray smoke bush. And it goes the most absolutely stunning, stop traffic, hot, fiery, 
coral that you've ever seen. It's absolutely striking. And so when you get some light behind that, those large leaves in the late summer and early fall, it's absolutely stunning. And so then what happens with these rose hips is they've got, they've, they've been growing and getting fatter and they get even more showy. The thorns on that particular rose are even beautiful, but that blue foliage is going to get even yet a little bit more blue with the cold before you start getting some fall color on the entire combination. And it is just an amazing personality change. And so with this particular combination, one of the plants we suggested pairing with it was a blue oak grass just to play up on that blue foliage of that rosa glauca and add another texture down around the feet, the, the knees and ankles of that combination. And oh, like that. Uh, just just beautiful. Yeah, gorgeous combination. And so incredibly hardy and easy, pretty much no matter where you live. All right, let's go to aging gracefully next. Yeah, this is this is a really elegant one. It's actually playing off of some of the same colors we were just discussing. Um, and this is another one where I always call this multiple personality in order. <laughs> <laughs> True. You know, I, it's where you've got so many things that can change throughout the season, this combination of plants, that you get these multiple different looks depending on when you're viewing it. And so... That is really important with foliage is that you want those personality transitions during the, the various seasons. And I always tell my clients, you know, you're paying taxes on this amount of property. Let's make those plants work for you a little harder, right? <laughs> I like and that. And so the sorbaria or the false spirea shrub comes out with, and I, I don't even really know that there are thumbnail does it justice for just how intensely brightly colored the new growth is. So we do show it a little bit in that thumbnail. It's really a hot, fiery coral and red combination with a little bit of chartreuse. But it also has a tremendous amount of texture on those on those leaves. It's really beautiful and elegant and very kind of feminine. And then in summer, it has a little white sort of a stilby-like flower that isn't super exciting, but it's another point of personality for that particular plant. And then we're using the gray smoke bush again for that personality and interest where you have that larger leaf against the really fine lacy foliage of the sorbaria. And then, of course, we live in the Northwest where Japanese maples are, are king, sort of like kukura here. You can't go anywhere without tripping over one. And we're so blessed to be able to have 8 billion different Japanese maples here. But this one, the Beni Shishihangi, also have got so much personality with this rose edge margin, rose and off-white margin. And then it gets some beautiful rose tones in the fall as well. And there's an urn in this photo that we call, in each page, we have sort of a finishing touch. So what's the one thing that sort of holds this together? And this particular urn is a beautiful naturalistic old world browns and grays. And it looks like maybe an old Grecian oil urn. And we like it because it has that age showing. It's got a little bit of moss on it. It's not looking perfectly shiny and clean, but it just is the right dynamic set and nestled in amongst these different foliage textures together that makes it work so beautifully. It kind of gives it a sense of history in this in this photo. Yes, and I thought it also really anchored the whole entire yeah. scene. So much of that foliage is very light and wispy, the false spirea, and then the smoke bush, and it's all very light and airy. And then you put this very substantial urn at the bottom. It looks gorgeous. It gives it some visual weight. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Well, the next one I wanted to go through with you is called Cherry Garcia. Love the creative names you guys came up with for these combinations. <laughs> Tell us about this one, Christina. Well, clearly, Karen and I were hungry when we titled this <laughs> because they're, well, they're either after cocktails or desserts or some kind of food item. And pretty much, I think chocolate and red wine got us through this entire time. <laughs> exactly. So, Cherry Garcia must have been written on one of those nights, I'm sure. And, you know, this is just a really indulgent, rich combination of color where you have this dark chocolate Diablo 9 bark, which is just so rich. 
And it's got something for absolutely every season on that particular plant where you have that beautiful dark foliage that turns almost kind of a red tinge in fall. And it blooms with these little white, round flower heads that turn to the most glorious, deep, kind of garnet, ruby red seed heads. And then in winter, you've got this fantastic bark, this peeling bark that's really interesting to look at. It's not a boring plant. It's very multi-seasonal. And so this photo is just so luscious because there's this fantastic clematis that's scrambling its way up through the shrub. And it's got these just super rich, double fat buds that are kind of a raspberry or cherry tone. They're just gorgeous. And they're nestling and mingling together so beautiful, just like uh, a fabulous dessert would be. And so it's a really well-thought-out combination. I mean, it really works, depending on the season that you're looking at it for quite some time. It's an easy and hardy combination as well. It's going to cover a lot of parts of the country to be able to do this. And then you can add in some winter blooming interest here, say with a hellebore, like the cinnamon snow, which has beautiful pinky cinnamon town flowers in late winter or really early spring, I guess would be what you call it. But it's a beautiful pairing and easy too. It is. And what I love about it is that you did get creative here and you were telling people, yes, think about clematis when you're planting shrubs because they love to climb up and ramble through shrubs. They don't just have to be planted beneath a trellis. Exactly. Especially some of these smaller scaled ones. You know, some of them, you know, they want to eat your house. But others are just so small and delicate and feminine. They can go in lots and lots of different places. I mean, I could envision this same clematis climbing up the Japanese maple we were talking about a minute ago in one of the other combinations. So it's it's good to think out of the box in how you use plants sometimes. Yeah, very much so. Well, and to even, you know, think about something like clematis, which, again, I think so many, especially beginning gardeners, think of that in isolation. Where am I putting this? And then they'll kind of put it off to the side or off by itself. And you're really encouraging people to see every plant as a partner in the garden. Exactly. Or dessert, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> All right. Uh, Karen, let's talk about uh, one of my personal favorites. You called it Savvy Solution. Tell us the right. plants that make up this one and then how this combination works together. Well, Savvy Solution is a, a beautiful combination. I wish I could say I was the designer. I wasn't. Um, but it's one that would work equally well in Texas, as in England, as in the Pacific Northwest, because it's really working for a hot, dry location with poor soil. And the spotlight plant, the key feature in this plant is this gorgeous big yellow mullein. Now, you know, yellow mullein, the babascums, are an underrated perennial. They have these gorgeous big velvety leaves and a kind of a silvery tone, very fuzzy. And so the image shows the basal rosette of that. And what the designer did was showcase that color and showcase how big and fuzzy it was by pairing it with things that were spiky. And so it's teamed with a color guard yucca, which has that same silvery blue, but highlighted with yellow. And then the limelight or that finishing touch are the, the sapphire blue sea holly, which has got the most gorgeous metallic blue bracts, which attracts bees for miles around. And that's kind of weaving its way up through the fuzzy mullein leaves. So it's just a really striking combination, which is very easy care and would suit the most rocky, inhospitable soil in the hottest location of your garden. Well, and I'm so glad that you brought up the Color Guard Yucca, Karen, because it's just mm -hmm. peeking out of the background there, but it's such a yeah. wonderful compliment. It is, and it's deer-resistant. Hallelujah. For those of us who struggle <laughs> with these things, it's deer-resistant, drought-tolerant, it's low-maintenance, um, I mean, and it will have a fragrant flowering spike eventually. Um, but it's just, it's such a, a dramatic inclusion in this combination, as I specifically as it contrasts so well with the texture of the mullein leaf. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the verbascan, the mullein. 
how do you source that? How do you grow that? A lot of people in the Midwest see that as a weed. I know. <laughs> I say, you, you, know, you can't afford to be a plant snob. You know, if you're <laughs> going to be doing this, we need to put those misconceptions to one side and, and look at everything for its own merit. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a short-lived perennial, um, and it will self-seed. And, you know, so the new seed is going to come up in a slightly different place so that this combination is going to be constantly evolving. Um, I actually prefer the basal rosette of foliage over the flowering spikes. It's just that leaf that really appeals to me. But, you know, if it's a weed in, in somebody else's garden, maybe this is one way to showcase it and make it earn its keep in the garden. I, I think it's super. Yeah. I have to jump in and tell you something really funny that I saw just last night. I was watching Pride and Prejudice, and there was a scene where, you know, the, the, the main character, she's running out onto this balcony with Mr. Darcy chasing after her. And they stop, and right in front of the ledge of this balcony is a single pot with a smolane in it. And it was absolutely spectacular, and I had to pause and go back for 30 seconds every time just to see this beautiful, spectacular, singular foliage plant. There weren't a bunch of flowers around it. There weren't anything. They were just highlighting that amazing foliage in one pot all by itself. And that was in England. That's crazy. There we go. Well, and if and that's how if, I remember them actually as a wildflower in England. That's my greatest memory of them. Oh, okay. So if if listeners are hearing this and they're a fan of lamb's ears, they should love this plant. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Very similar in texture. Lamb's ears is um, the foliage is a little smaller, but it is more silver. It would be a good substitute. You might even want to consider the Stachys byzantina, the um, Bellish Grigio, which is a slightly larger version, in a sense, of the lamb's ears. Um, that's a kind of an iffy perennial for me. It's my, I tend to use it as an annual if it survives over winter, so much the better. Okay. But certainly that would be an alternative. Huh. And you mentioned with your verbascums, you keep them cut, you prevent that stalk from shooting up with the seed head on it. Is that what you do, Karen? Yeah, I actually prefer the foliage um, than I than I do the flowering spike. So that that's just how I would treat it. Okay. But you know, everybody can make this what they want. This is their garden, not mine. We're, we're just giving you the ideas. Yep. Nope. I love it. I love it. Well, and for someone who's maybe a little nervous about that going all over their garden, that's one way to handle yeah. it. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, way to very it. true. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the next one: pocket prairie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, meadow design has become very popular, hasn't it, in recent years? There's Absolutely. been a lot of talk about creating um, yeah. matrix planting of grasses and perennials. And this is a pocket-sized version of that that you can do in the smallest space. It's very, very simple. It's simply uh, a grass. In this case, it's a variegated purple moor grass, the Melenia variegata. And that is forming the matrix or the main planting. And into that are two different cone flowers. Uh, one is the white swan cone flower, the single white classic cone flower. And then there's also a double white cone flower. Funnily enough, the homeowner didn't realize she had two types of cone flower. She thought they were all white swan. And when they it bloomed, she realized there were two. It still works because the beauty of this is it's pure simplicity. Uh, the color scheme is that very soft, um, pale yellow, a uh, creamy white, and uh, just a nice mid-green in there. And the flowers are revealed through this scrim of the wispy foliage from the grass. Um, beautiful, soft look. Um, it, it really was enchanting when I came across it. Yeah, it absolutely is. That's why I picked it. I thought, oh man, we have to talk about this one. I love that. Yeah. And I love that the homeowner didn't realize there were two different echinacea there. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Very easy to copy. And if someone, you know, wanted to repeat this, but using pink echinacea, mm-hmm. you know, you again, you can take this idea and make it to suit your particular color choices, plant preferences, but just to use that idea of having the grass as a, a scrim for these simple flowers was very effective. Yeah. Well, I have to say, when I stumbled on this next one, it's called Beauty Without the Beast. I actually just mm-hmm. stopped for a second when I saw this picture. I had to just look at it and take mm-hmm. it in. There's a lot going on here, 
but it's the color of that lily that's just unbelievable. Yeah. Right. And, and we got caught out with this one. It's an interesting story. To give a context for our listeners here, there's a beautiful lily, which is a soft melon shade, and it's framed by the golden foliage of a golden locust tree. And at the base, there is the rich green um, dwarf Japanese cedar. So just three simple elements in here. And But as you say, it's the lily that catches our eye, and we we love lilies. Um, but the trouble is they don't bloom for very long, which goes back to the premise of the book, is how do we build a foliage framework to really make this lily look glorious when it's in bloom, but not leaving a big black hole in the garden when it's not in bloom. And so by framing it with um, colorful leaves and enhance the lily itself, you solve that problem. <laughs> The other problem we had with this was that the originally we were told the name of this lily was African Queen. And the designer, with hand on heart, ordered, and he's a well-known designer, he ordered African Queen lilies and planted them believing they were African Queen lilies. And it wasn't until this image was published, we had um, messages come through from lily experts say there is no way that can be African Queen and went into all the reasoning. Um, so we know now that the lily was mislabeled. These things happen. So what we have done in the book is we have worked with some experts and we have given a recommendation that the variety Menorca would be a perfect substitute to use in this combination. It would have the same appearance, the same color, the same height. But we don't actually know what the name is of the variety which is <laughs> featured in the photograph. So with the best intentions, you know, things happen. <laughs> yes. Well, and you know, what's interesting about this to me is that this lily, to give people a visual, is a very, uh, it's either a very pale pink or kind of a pale coral. Anyway, it's a very, uh, you know, kind of a duller uh, shade of pink. Mm -hmm. And on its own or paired maybe with something else that's not as dramatic as this lime, mm -hmm. I think it would just be something that you could easily overlook in the garden. Yes, I think it would be very insipid without this foliage to yes. add some depth to it. Yes. So if you have a plant that you're like, hmm, I don't know. I, I mean, I can even think of some of Stilby that I could walk right by and not give two hoots mm -hmm. about. But if you pair it with something lime, I mean, look at that pop. That's something yeah, else. Yeah, exactly. The foliage draws your eye, and then you can appreciate the smaller detail of the flower. Again, that time factor. You know, you can appreciate the flowers when they're there, but you're not going to have a sense there's a great black visual hole in the garden when those blooms are no longer happening because you still have the leaves. Yeah. Well, let's move into shade which is so easy because the book's color-coded and I can easily see just by fanning the pages where we're headed next here. And <laughs> we're going to this next one that's called All the Right Notes. Mm -hmm. Christina, you want to tell us about this wonderful combination? I was very partial to this one, if for no other reason than for the gymnastic contortions that I had to go through to get this photograph. <laughs> 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 At my age, this was not easy, but it was worth it. I mean, this this little section of this garden was just so pulled together and so elegant. And one of the reasons why I wanted to title it All the Right Notes is because just like music, you know, your eye has to travel around a composition and have sort of a beginning, a middle, and an end, or things that tie the melodies together or tie the different notes together. And this combination certainly does that. And so we kind of likened it to cool jazz. So the plants in combination are the the cherry heart barren wart, which is an epimedium. And cherry heart is such an excellent name for it because it's a very heart-shaped foliage, but it has a very distinct sort of a cherry red leaf margin around the edge, which is very, very dramatic. And barren wart tend to have beautiful little subtle blooms on them. And on this particular one, I could just care less if it ever bloomed. I'm sure the blooms are gorgeous, but with foliage like that, who needs blooms, you know, is kind of mm -hmm. the way that I think about it. 
And so it's very dramatic, and, and this is a low combination. So this is going to be something you're going to want to have sort of close up in the partial shade garden or shade garden. And then next to that, we have this beautiful bug vein. It's called pink spike but it's a very, very black foliage. And so later on in the season, you're going to have fragrant pink spike flowers on it that are sort of a pale, subtle pink. Um, And it's a long bloomer. It's like August through October. So it holds those blooms a long time. But when you have that black sort of lacy bug vein foliage, which has beautiful texture and veining on it, next to that epimedium, it is so dramatic. And then you're looking in the sort of the background of this combination. You see these absolutely pure snow white primroses that are just luscious. Because it's such an absolutely snow white contrast with the black and the other foliage. And then you wrap it up down kind of in the lower portion of the photo with a beautiful palmate large scale leaf of the Corsican hellebore called Green Corsican Christmas Rose. And this one's not in bloom yet because this is just the wrong season to see those blooms. This would have been uh, already blooming. And the new growth on that foliage is just these large, luscious, bright green leaves. And so it's the texture that pulls everything together when you have these large, medium, and fine textures in such a sophisticated combination. And the colors on this for the listeners, this is, to me, what I call a very 21st century color combination. So, very, very pure white, very, very fresh, fresh spring greens. And then you have a deep black and a beautiful red. And so, you could add into this to extend the seasonality an amazing black print coleus, for example. And that would really kind of turn up the volume on this combination in summer when your epimedium tend, or your barren wort tends to fade and get a little bit more bland when it doesn't have that real intense heart-shaped leaf margin on the edge to stand out. So that's one way to extend this combination. But I just love the jazzy rhythm that this combination has. Yeah. And I'm so glad you spent some time talking about that Cherry Hearts, Barren Wart. It's zones five through eight. I'm a zone four gardener. But I tell you what, I would buy that one and just have it be an annual because it's that beautiful. If I move to zone five, that'll be one of the first on my list. I really like that (laughs) one. It's so pretty. It's very striking, that's for sure. Yeah. But it's kind of toned down a little bit. You've got the purple bringing it back down to earth, and then you've got those delicate white blooms behind it. It's really pretty. Great combination. Yeah, that wood, that woodland primrose is a real winner for people who've never tried it. It's a beautiful little colonizer, and it also comes in a real soft kind of lavender tone, too, that's gorgeous. Woodland primrose. All right, note to self. Spring fever. Boy, that's a great title for this particular one. There's a lot going on here. There is, and it's definitely uh, not the subtle color of all the right notes that Christina (laughs) was just talking about. That's exactly right. (laughs) Yeah, this was uh, actually photographed in the display gardens at Terranova Nurseries. Uh, Mm. We were just talking about Dan Himes earlier. So this is his display garden, and it is an absolute tapestry of bold colors, bright textures, uh, this vivid, fiery orange um, coral bells in the foreground, actually the variety Fire Alarm. And immediately behind that, there's a Heucarella called Solar Power, which has a yellow leaf speckled with some of this fiery orange. So we have that color echo going right on. That's right in the front and center of the scene. And, and that's our main color scheme here is, is the, the yellow and the fiery orange. The yellow is repeated also in the foliage of a bleeding heart called Gold Heart, mm. which is has a ferny foliage with a golden wreath to it and little pink flowers. Mm. And even in um, a hellebore flower, which is peeking into the scene, which is a soft um, sort of buttery yellow shade. But then again, that limelight detail thrown in the wild card, tucked away in there, there's actually a, a hint of blue. Yeah. And it's a blue corridalis, and I just love the corridalis as a perennial. Very, very delicate, um, ferny foliage, um, enchanting blue flowers. And this one is a, a deep periwinkle blue. 
And it just adds up something unexpected. I think without that, it's almost too much. You know, there's just so much of the bright orange and then that, you know, vivid gold. And you add in the blue and it just throws in something a little bit different. And to me, that's what really completes this scene. Well, in that conversation we had earlier, Hookara Hot List. I mm-hmm. mean, that's really at play here. That's right. Yeah, definitely. There's some gorgeous ones. And, you know, you could, if you didn't want this color scheme, you wanted something with a similar look using different plants, you could look to, say, the hardy geranium family for leaves which have a similarity to Heuchera. Um, For example, that's the um, solar power foamy bells, that yellow one. You know, you could consider adding in the blue sunrise hardy geranium, which has a golden leaf and a blue flower later on. So again, there are always ways to mix this up, make it your own, um, adapt it as you wish. You're right. Christina, there's one called The New Black, and it's made up of ladies' mantle, Japanese forest grass, and feverfew. Yeah, you know, this one is actually really a little special to me because I kind of had to fight to get this one in the book a little bit because it was in my messy front yard and Karen's like, you got to make sure you get that photo cleaned up. <laughs> but, it was, but it was really, it's a sweet combination. And I have a thing for this, uh, you know, kind of modernistic color sensibility with the chartreuse and blue tones together. But this particular one takes this really old-fashioned plant, this little fever few, and takes it up a notch by using it in the chartreuse form, the Tanacetum arium. And it's just a beautiful little herbaceous perennial. And I have kind of gone back and forth over the certain years where I don't let it flower with that sweet little daisy some years. And then other years I let it flower. And some people have a real problem with that one because they feel like if you let her flower, she's just going to be a little bit invasive. And honestly, I have found this plant to put itself in the most beautiful places when I do let it flower. So I don't find it to be a thug the way some other plants could be. Now, this is in combination with this amazing all-gold Japanese forest grass, the Kanakloa all-gold, which is just graceful and fantastic and easygoing and, and easy to use. But then you kind of do have that big thug there in the ladies' mantle. And that's one you do have to be a little bit more careful with as far as invasiveness because if you do let those flowers ripen and set seed, it can get quite messy. But the combination of these three together, just the colors, it was at the height of the, the TV show Orange is the New Black. And it reminded me, you know, it's kind of like chartreuse is sort of the new black right now in garden design. And everybody wants chartreuse and high contrast or bright colors in the shade. And this particular combination with the textures together really made that combination work. And so this is one, again, where you can have the flowers or not have the flowers, and it's still going to have a lot of energy and sparkle no matter which way you go. Great points there. I like that, the chartreuse being the new black. How about Bells of Spring, Karen? I know. Isn't this gorgeous? This is actually a photograph which Christina took. And uh, it features another barren wart, another epimedium, but a different variety this time. Uh, In fact, the scene is just three plants, and that's often all it needs. Um, You know, when you're building a garden, if you can just start with a group of three and and work from there. So I think the most eye-catching one is the sulfurium barren wart, which again has heart-shaped leaves with this wonderful rust color. Um, overlaying a, a brighter light green veining, very, very striking. Um, echoing the dark rust tones in this, above it is the large um, shrub, an Andromeda called Mountain Fire. I have this particular shrub in my own garden. It's a beautiful um, evergreen, has somewhat reminiscent of a rhododendron, not as coarse as that. The new foliage is an incredible uh, mahogany color. And it changes intensity as the season goes through. But Christina's captured it where you can just see that new growth is echoing the color that you're seeing on the epimedium beneath it. Throwing in some finer texture, there's, again, a variegated purple moorgrass with that nicely fine stripe. 
but what must be just the most fragrant um, scene, what's really captivating here are the flowers on the Andromeda. Because at this particular moment, it is just a festoon of these creamy white flowers which are dangling from the branches and draping over the lower plants. The whole scene is its very simple. It absolutely celebrates spring. It's relying on foliage, but those flowers are definitely the finishing touch that just give it that final moment. Well, Andromedas are often underappreciated in the garden, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I particularly love some of the smaller ones like um, Little Heath, which has a variegated leaf that will only grow to about three feet tall and wide, nice compact mound. But then you can go to something like Mountain Fire, which I like, which will go six to eight feet tall and even wider. So there's one for, you know, that space wherever it might be in the garden. But yes, I really, I prefer them over rhododendrons, truthfully. I think they're um, of great value in the garden. Less temperamental than a rhodi as well. Right. Um, Yes, definitely. And I don't seem to see the same level of damage from vine weevils on these. Um, I don't know if, you know, how many gardeners listening um, struggle with those as I do. But some of my old rhodi varieties just get decimated with those little notches on the edges of the the leaves. Yes. um, Thanks to the vine weevils. And the Andromeda that I have don't seem to be as bothered. So that's a definite plus in my favor. How about triptych? Triptych is a wonderful three-way combination. Obviously, tri and triptych is, is a lot of what this refers to. This little scene here is really about highlighting these different tones and hues of pink. So you have this triad of these different leaf shapes and textures, but the hue that links this whole thing together is between the the burgundy of the hookara, the beautiful little pink blooms, the variegated Solomon seal, and if you look very carefully in this photo showing the Solomon seal, you'll see the faint tone and hue of that pink that runs right down that stem. And those are the kind of details we want you to look at when you're trying things on in the nursery together. And then the macadamia is a wonderful sort of newer plant on the market. This one's called Crimson Sands Macadamia. And this is a fantastic new herbaceous ground cover. It dies all the way back to the ground. But if you notice carefully, you'll see just that beautiful hint, that blush of that rouge pink that's starting in spring on this combination, or actually later summer, really, or later spring. And then it's going to get really beautiful red tones all through the fall on that foliage. Very, very striking and showy and uh, dramatic on those big sort of palmate, almost uh, big fan-shaped leaves. So... This is a this is a fun one, and you could add in. This would be another one. We're adding in a hellebore for winter. Would be a gorgeous option to take this a little bit longer through the season. A white flowering hellebore would be very striking. Well, and look at the wide zone on all of these. You've got the Solomon seal that zone three through eight, the Muckdenia zones four through nine, and then the coral bells, of course, zones four through nine. So this you can grow this combination almost anywhere. Yeah, right. What you said about the Solomon seal too, Christina, I am just like hitting myself as you're saying that going, see, there you go. There's that spotlight mentality that Karen introduced us to. But if you would have asked me to tell you what color the stem was on a Solomon seal, I would have said green. And then I'm looking at this beautiful image you've got here and, oh, no, I would be wrong because it's a red. (laughs) (laughs) Karen's really good at picking up those kind of details. Sometimes I miss them too, but once you, you know, I'm always telling people, once you see it, you can't unsee it anymore. That's right. It becomes like a treasure hunt. You know, suddenly the world is so much more exciting. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Well, I'm a believer now. I tell you what, this is, this has opened my eyes. There is a, a skill to being a good spotlighter on plants. But it's a great personal challenge when you're in the nursery the next time to really study those plants and all of the different colors and the textures that make these plants up that we often just overlook. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Let's check on the next combination, Starstruck. We've got two left here in this 
spring and summer combinations, and then we're going to move into fall and winter combinations. Yeah, starstruck is a great one. You were just talking about, you know, observation, taking that time to be more observant. I would say take that a step further and be more observant um, to see how things evolve, to see how plants change color during the season. And this is a great example because this particular grouping of plants includes a hosta um, called pineapple upside down cake. And this is really unusual because it emerges as a, a green leaf um, before the center turns gold, ending up with an ultimately a variegated leaf. So it changes. And what this particular scene does, it captures it at the moment in time when it's really at its most beautiful variegated self. So that hosta has been teamed with a coleus, and the coleus itself has a gold outer margin, and the inner portion is a kind of a raspberry burgundy tone. So that's the foliage framework right there. And what's fun is the way the designer introduced into this the star-shaped flowers of the lime green flowering tobacco plants and kochiana. And so you have these creamy lime green flowers just bursting like little stars popping up out of the top of this foliage framework. And, you know, you were talking about zones earlier. Clearly, the Nicotiana and the Coleus are both annuals. The Hosta is hardy to zone three. So this is a combination that a zone three gardener could reproduce or get the idea and, again, you know, adapt the colors to suit your own preference. If you wanted to um, extend the season of interest, you might want to include, say, the heather bun white cedar, uh, as a chemiseparous heather bun. I've got a beautiful, finely textured form that's uh, green in summer and has a purple cast to it in winter. So you could bring that alongside if you wanted to have less of a gap in the, um, the winter season when everything would be either died down or would be removed. But really fun. Um, I really like this combination that this designer put together. I love it. And I also love the pineapple upside down cake hosta. If for no other reason than I want to tell people I have a hosta named that, that's fantastic. <laughs> and, I, and I love how you described how it transforms too, because yeah. even just looking at this picture, which is stunning enough, I'm falling mm-hmm. in love with it, hearing about how it matures over time. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a really wide one. It, it grows about four feet wide, but it's not tall. So this is something you could put at the front of the border if you wanted or a little bit further back. Um, it's really quite versatile. Let's wrap this up with tickled pink, and then we'll move into fall and winter combinations. This particular combination that we're featuring in tickled pink um, we're showing plants that might be appropriate in Florida, in the South, places where you have more humidity, um, hotter temperatures, things like that. But this could also be really good value for gardeners who want to take plants and have them overwinter inside as house plants. Because some of the plants that we're showing in this combination are not inexpensive at all. So if you were to use them in the South, they would be a really great long-lived value outside and no problem whatsoever. But up here, for instance, or in Portland or in Minneapolis or what have you, it might be more expensive to buy these plants. And so to be able to know that you could overwinter these plants very, very easily inside, actually most of them is combination, um, is a really good way to extend your dollar. So the plants that we're featuring in this combination are a Chinese evergreen called Lady Valentine, which is the most exquisite. I don't know how to describe it other than saying it's Pepto-Bismol pink speckle. <laughs> it's really a beautiful foliage plant. And Chinese evergreen is one that, you know, if you've ever taken notice of plants that are in malls or doctor's offices or restaurants, Chinese evergreen is a very, very common one. But some of these fancy colored versions um, are not seen so frequently. And so that's what makes this particular one more valuable. And then it's paired here with a, a good old Boston fern. And this Boston fern is showing just this super lush, bright green growth on it, which is a gorgeous color contrast highlighting some of the green in that Chinese evergreen, but also texturally as well. And then for the finishing touch, the uber dramatic urn plant or 
Uh, you might know it as a type of bromelia. This particular one has just these big, wide, luscious leaves with a very, very dramatic pale pink flower in the center, echoing back that Chinese evergreen pink foliage. And then we have some tropical or sometimes drought-tolerant planting kangaroo pots, which a lot of people might not be familiar with. They come in a million different colors and different heights, and they have kind of a grassy foliage. But the fuzzy, fuzzy flowers look like little uh, kangaroo toes. They're really cute. but They're beautiful pink in this combination. So you can take that Chinese evergreen and make it a house plant. Take that Boston fern and make it a house plant. Take that fern plant, the acnea, and make that a house plant. But in a container outside on a patio in a warm climate or a hot summer um, in your area, this is a long, long lasting and really dramatic combination. And so it's going to be a, just a, a hearty and, and dramatic display in a, in a shade garden or shade container. I love that, Christina, and all your talk about using houseplants or incorporating houseplants in some of these combinations was inspiring to me. And I'm starting to think about how I can pair even my poinsettia with other houseplants and just kind of staging that. Yeah, exactly. When I'm shopping for plants, I, I tell my clients and whatnot that you have to shop every section of the nursery and garden center. You need to shop ground covers. You need to shop annuals. You need to shop perennials, trees, shrubs, and house plants because you're going to find things like even a little polka dot plant that can be just the exact little detail that you needed to pull something together. Great point. Well, let's head into fall and winter. We're going to review some combinations for sun, and then we'll head into some shade recommendations. Okay. Yeah, I think one that you particularly liked was called a warm embrace. Yes. And, uh, we were just been talking a little bit about good value. And to me, this is another example. This particular combination features a delightful Japanese maple with a very finely cut leaf. And, you know, Japanese maples are not inexpensive. But when, when you find one that you can afford, it's rarely large enough to put in prime place in the garden where you want it to be a specimen feature. And so what this homeowner has done is planted this delightful maple in a glossy black pot. Now, not only that, instead of just looking at dark, dirty plant potting soil on the surface, she has top-dressed that with black rocks, the black Mexican pebbles. So that's our real focal point in the scene, and it is framed by foliage. So in the foreground, we have a sweep of a heather called firefly heather. Now, this is not your grandma's heather, the sort that swallows the dog and the cat and the neighbor's cat and, you know, one of those. (laughs) This is a really special heather. Um, It's Kaluna firefly, and it's one whose foliage transitions through shades of green and gold until it becomes brick red in the winter. And that's besides the fact it has flowers. So the foliage of this heather is delightful. So if you can imagine any one of those colors showing up against that glossy black pot. And then just behind the container is another low-growing shrub. This time it's a crimson pygmy barberry. Um, So low-growing, deep, rich burgundy tones to it that adds uh, a depth of color to the maple, which in fall has turned this delightful orange shade. There are some other foliage plants in there. So the whole color scheme is very warm in terms of its color tone. But the the essence of it is really as an idea for readers that, you can take that specimen maple you've always wanted and is still a little baby and put it in a container and have it live large, become a focal point by surrounding it with complementary foliage. And when it's large enough, then you can transplant it into the garden itself if that's what you want to do. And I love that you pointed out the top dressing here and even the pot selection because Mm -hmm. there was really no detail that was spared here. And it really is, as you first look at it, it's the pebbles, it's the stones that are the top dressing that first catch my eye. After I see the beautiful color of this Japanese maple, I immediately go to that. And I think that works so well because the laciness of the maple foliage against that solid black pot and then the round, smooth pebbles 
you know, both the pot and the pebbles are adding other tactile senses to the scene. You're so right. That is exactly right. Well, this next one looks like it could be a scene out of my garden in Minnesota right now. We've had a lot of frost in the mornings. And this one is called Golden Moments. Christina? This one is showing you dramatically how important form is in the winter or fall and winter gardens. Because you don't have all the fluffy bits necessarily to rely on. In, in every season. And so form is going to be really important when things are frosted or snowed and what have you. So this particular scene shows off beautiful color combinations of conifers, but it also shows this fantastic container with a piece of artwork in it. And this artwork is a rusted metal agave. And it is just so standout in this scene and right behind it is the beautiful golden sword yucca with its narrow, strappy spikiness and this gold with this sort of blue edge on it, which is contrasting with the wide metal leaves of the agave, this piece of artwork in the pot. And then behind that, you have a golden spreader fur, which anchors this entire combination. It's got a beautiful soft gold tone, which pulls that yucca in, and then takes your eye straight down to the foreground where you have this really handsome Chief Joseph uh, Lodgepole Pine, which is a real collector's conifer, slow-growing and just so handsome, but giving another texture and repeating that gold tone again. And then in the center of the photo off to the right, covered in a heavier frost, is the good old blue star juniper. And, you know, when you're looking at the color wheel and putting colors together, blue and gold are such good friends that they always look gorgeous together. But when you add in the russet of that agave artwork, it just makes it. And then I also just want to point out one thing in this photo that absolutely just makes my heart sing. And it's such a small detail, but I love it. It's the fact that around this agave artwork in this pot are some sedum, some trailing sedum. And my guess is it's probably a red dragon or something similar to that. I'm not sure. But it looks like it's really done its bit for God and country and sort of gone out of season. But the trailing arms of this plant going over the edge gives such a neat texture against this piece of artwork in this scene. It's just what makes it for me. It's gorgeous. Well, first of all, that agave, that rusted metal agave sculpture, if I can get my hands on one of those, I'll be uh, very happy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so glad you pointed out the detail of the red dragon over the edge because that's immediately what I thought, too. I was so glad you mentioned that. Yeah, I I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful plant. Oh, it's just, and then seeing it like that in winter, you know, a lot of times in the spring here in Minnesota, I'll come out and sometimes it it just does not survive. But what you're left with are those octopus arms. And I've used those in arrangements, just can't bear to part with them. I think they're so beautiful. Um, And I have to say, I always pat any gardener on the back when I see their yucca that's just standing tall in a winter garden. I feel like it has no business being in Minnesota or the Midwest once the snow starts to fall. And anytime you see it, it's just so satisfying. It's like, yes, we get a little piece of of warmer climates here that we can actually grow. And it really is beautiful in the winter garden. So I love that you included that here. (laughs) It's a really neat and very subtle one, but the architecture of those plants, I think it's something that a lot of people forget when they're thinking about designing for winter interest. Yep, you're so right. Yeah, that was a great combination. The next one is Fall Symphony, and I loved this one as well. There's a lot going on in this one. (laughs) Well, this is actually a scene from my garden. And um, so, yeah, it's interesting seeing it a few years ago when I took this photograph. This is all about textures, and we think of fall as, you know, seasonal color. We tend to immediately think of Japanese maples and the colors that they bring. But this scene is really showing the textures of fall to my eye. Front and center in this is a a thunderhead Japanese black pine, the really bold texture to it, and just a hint of those silky white candles which are going to come forth in spring. 
And behind that, there's a switchgrass, which you can grow in zone four. That's the Shenandoah grass, um, beautiful vertical grass, which has orange-green blades tipped with burgundy, except by fall, the whole thing goes through shades that lend it more of a, a tan with a sort of an orange overtone to it. So that's behind this rich green pine. And then combining those colors, pulling them together, it's one of my favorite trees. It's a Persian ironwood, a parotia. This particular variety is ruby vase. And honestly, if you can grow it, it's a zone five tree. Um, any zone five readers, if you see ruby vase parotia, you need to go and find room for it. It's not a wide plant, um, not a wide tree the way the species is. It's much more modest than that. But the foliage color is out of this world. It, it opens green with purple around the edges. And during the summer, it has burgundy, purple, and then you get into fall and you throw into that some oranges and yellows. Oh, my goodness, it's an absolute kaleidoscope. And this tree even has interesting bark and spidery red flowers in January. I mean, seriously, this is a tree everybody needs to be trying to grow. I just adore it. So that's sort of pulling those colors together. And then tucked into that scene, there's a, a golden spire going into its fall color and a sweep of black-eyed Susan seed heads, the Rebecca Goldstone. And uh, we watch this scene from our living room and we have just put a new window in. Actually, it's one of the things my husband and I have been enjoying so much is watching the birds dive onto the seed heads of the black-eyed Susans every day. It, it's just so much fun seeing them, you know, looking for the little seeds there. So it's a very dynamic scene in that way. But the whole composition together, I say it, the colors are subtle, um, but it's the textures, the layers of textures, and uh, which really make this appealing. You're a lucky woman, Karen. You get to see Thank this you. every day. <laughs> Well, I have to say, well, this is a this is such a great example. This one in particular to me was such a great example of why it was important for you to take the wide shot to show the scene and then to highlight each plant individually and why it works so well. Because looking at this, I, I wouldn't have said that the Black-Eyed Susan caught my eye initially. But the more I study the picture, I don't know that I could have said, oh, yeah, that's Black-Eyed Susan. So it's great right. to turn the page and then see, huh, that's Black-Eyed Susan. The other thing I have to ask you, since this image really begs the question, is do you leave a lot of plant material up throughout the winter? I'm selective. And I'm, actually, I'm very selective in the, the amount of perennials that I grow and which perennials I grow because my aim is to have a lower maintenance garden. I have five acres here. I'm in a rural mm -hmm. part of Washington in Duval. And so I focus on trees and shrubs as my framework and I'm really selective as to which perennials I include. The ones I do include are things like the Rebecca because they don't benefit from deadheading. I don't need to deadhead them in order them for them to continue to bloom because they bloom late in the season anyway. And if I leave the seed heads up, the birds will enjoy them. I just have to be aware that in the Pacific Northwest, also known as the Pacific Northwest, we get an awful lot of rain. <laughs> and whereas this scene is delightful in the photograph, it was beautiful etched with frost. Shortly after that, it was just a black mush. And there's nothing attractive about black mush. Uh, at that point, I had to go and clean it up and tidy it. Um, okay. So, you know, I if I was in Denver, I'd be able to leave them up for much longer because they would just freeze dry in place. But for those of us in a wetter climate, you have to be judicious in your choice. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and this is the wonderful thing about being the gardener of this garden is, you know, it's like, yes, yes, yes. I'm so glad you love the picture. Now, let me tell you the reality of living with this wonderful exactly. composition. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't get it 365, but for the days that we do get it, it's it's pretty splendid. Yeah. Okay, well, we've got two left here, and then we're going to talk about the shade compositions for fall and winter. This next one is called <clears throat> Mixed Up Mosaic. Yeah, and then this is Christina, and I shot this at a Japanese botanic garden. And this combination is just as you come through the entry, 
And I just happened to, when I was shooting this, I just happened to be speaking a lot about mosaics with a friend of mine who's an artist. And so it really struck me as kind of a mosaic combination when I looked at it. And the combination for the listeners is a plant that really is so maligned and abused in gas station plantings and grocery stores all over the country and malls where it's, it's called rock ketoniaster or ketoniaster horizontalis. And it's a low spreading deciduous shrub that has real tiny glossy green leaves. And then I love the way the, the leaves have this growth habit of this fishbone shape. And so they come out with beautiful little white flowers that then turn to these beautiful berries in late summer and fall before it gets some fall color and drops completely deciduous. But the combination here with this particular, you know, somewhat ubiquitous ketoniaster is really genius in this setting because the designer here has mixed it with a golden Japanese forest grass. And this particular one is areola because the beautiful dark green ribbon of striping that runs down on sort of a pale yellow grass. And this particular combination of just these two plants had been left to mix together over time. So rather than having a big clump of this Japanese forest grass and a big clump of ketoniaster, you have these two that really melded together into one combination in a really interesting and intriguing way that looks kind of like a mosaic to me. And so you have the very, you know, stiff branching of the ketoniaster with the very, very soft and arching grass together. It was very unique, and the colors together were just beautiful as well for the late season. So talk about, I mean, ultimately low maintenance. Holy cow. I mean, technically, you would want to maybe get into a Japanese forest grass and divide it every few years. But in this case, where they're mingled together, you might not do that. You might just kind of reach in there and rip their little heads off and clean them up in winter and call it good and just occasionally prune these branches so that there's nothing that's sticking out or or taking up too much space. But it's a dramatic and sort of elegant little mosaic combination. I could not agree with you more. You know, around here in in our family, my kids and I have this compliment. We've been paying each other since they were really little. I think I started started it with them because we would look at a lot of gardens or we'd be out admiring different things together. And I would always say to the kids, good eyes, good eyes, you know, when they'd see something and point it out to me. And that's what I have to say to you, Christina, on this one is good eyes because this combination (laughs) really is one where I I wish people could see this. Uh, You've got this beautiful ketoniaster and then just little hints of this forest grass popping through it. It it just is quite the scene. Yeah, I mean, it's taking such a pedestrian plant and weaving it together with something so elegant and coming up with a combination that I never would have thought of. No, and this one really does look like art. In fact, when I had read this, I had wrote across the top, Merry Christmas, because this is a picture. This is a horticultural image that I think you could frame and put up for the holidays. It's just got those beautiful Christmas colors. Pretty. Yeah, very pretty. I could see this in one of those really chunky gold frames. Over a mantle. Yeah. I mean, I'm there. I love that one. That's gorgeous. Put that on my to do list. Yeah, perfect. It's a good. It's a good. De- it's a good lesson in detail. It absolutely is. Exactly. All right, serendipity. The seed head serendipity photo. I loved this one as well. Karen, do you want to tell us about it? Sure. I, the thing I remember most about this combination was it was a bitterly cold day in Denver. I was in the Denver Botanic Garden. <laughs> And it was so cold, I had to keep going into the coffee shop. And I am so thankful to this day that the coffee shop was open because I would just be getting a mug of coffee, wrapping my hands around it, trying to thaw out so I could go back out again and work the shutter on my camera. It was so cold. Oh, Oh my goodness. (laughs) So the scene that you're looking at here is a dwarf Colorado blue spruce, and most likely the variety Montgomery. And in front of that is just a single image of a papery seed head from the sapphire blue sea holly that we met earlier in the Savvy Solution when it was with the yellow mine. And what caught my eye on this combination was that 
The bract of the sapphire blue sea holly at this point is just a kind of a washed out taupe light brown color. And instead of its brilliant blue summer color, which would echo the color of the needles of the blue spruce, as I looked at this, it drew my attention to the caramel colored stems and nodules on the conifer. So it was helping me see a detail I would otherwise be missing. And I thought that was a great lesson to myself again to look more carefully and to appreciate these tails in plants that we otherwise ignore. Um, so very, very simple. It would work year round when the sea holly was there in summer. You would have the blue echo. I say right now you have the echo of the, the brown tones. Just delightful. The reality we were talking about earlier, the reality in a Seattle garden is that my sea holly, and I grow lots of this particular perennial, um, they're black mush in the winter. Mine do not freeze dry and look like this because we don't have the cold, dry climate that Denver does. You may well be able to do this far more successfully than I can. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't a moment I can exactly reproduce in my garden, but I know there are many gardeners who will be listening that will be able to do just that. And I love your introduction here under the image, the combined image, the wide shot. You say, sometimes it pays to be a lazy gardener. The sea holly and Bruce Bruce were likely planted together for a summer display. And then here they make this unbelievable combination in winter. Gorgeous. Right, so hence serendipity. So an inspiring designer ah. and uh, often the best designer. There you go. I like that. Now I fully appreciate the title of that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move into shade combinations. We have four shade combinations that we're going to talk about. Christina, why don't you kick this off with your combination that you called Winter Sparklers? This is a spot where I wish that the listeners had smelled podcasting because they could get the fragrance of this amazing witch hazel that anchors this photo. It's Winter Beauty Witch Hazel. And it's a gold that has some sort of amber tone quality to it. It's a beautiful, beautiful thread-like flower. I would liken it to little firecracker explosions on the witch hazel flowers. So you're looking at this photo, which is the witch hazel in its full, full glory in late winter, just absolutely covered in these fragrant, fragrant flowers. Beautiful lichen all over the branches on this tree, which here in the Northwest is just akin to like wrinkles on your face. You can't walk 10 feet without growing lichen on your somewhere <laughs> in our climate. <laughs> but beneath this, beneath this beautiful witch hazel is an absolute thick, 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 dense carpet of another barren ward, another epimedium that we refer to in a few other combinations. This one is just sort of your basic green foliage. But it's a very thick, dense carpet, and this one grows a little bit taller, about 16 inches tall. This particular one, like so many of the medium, has the flowers, but this one flowers really beautifully. It's a good yellow flower, and so you're going to have your witch hazel bloom first, and then when the witch hazel is starting to fade with the flowers, then you're going to start getting those new Leaf growth coming out, which is a big oval shaped leaf. It's very dramatic. Just as the barren wart or the epimedium is coming on the flower. So it's a very simple combination, but with the fragrance of that witch hazel in winter. It's, this is actually in what we call the winter garden here at our arboretum in Seattle. It's a favorite spot for many people to see when the witch hazel start blooming. It's very popular. The nice thing about witch hazels, too, um, that I always like to make sure and emphasize with my clients is that you're going to have the most epic fall color on a witch hazel. Sometimes you'll have the entire rainbow circling one leaf. And so if this one is in shade or partial shade, you're going to have less fall color. If it's in more sun, you're going to have more fall color. So it kind of depends on your spot. But it's a simple and low-maintenance combination that's very dramatic with that fragrance in winter. Well, this one has a very magical quality to it. That barren wort on the bottom is so thick, so lush. 
Uh, it, to me, it looked like something out of Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit because it looks like it'd be <laughs> right outside of Bilbo Bagan's house, doesn't it? It's just yeah. something else. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's what it looks like where we live. It looks like The Hobbit everywhere. <laughs> you guys. Yeah, this was gorgeous. And I also wanted to just kind of tease you a little bit because I know that you devoted that those pages to the hookara, but I also think you have a little bit of a thing for Baron Ward. <laughs> it, it looks that way. And Hosta and let's see what else. And Ferns. And yeah, we could go on forever. <laughs> you know what I love the most about it though, both for both of you, Karen and Christina, is that I'm imagining putting your shopping carts next to the average person's shopping cart. And I would love to do a compare and contrast on that. Okay. <laughs> um, I can tell you kind of a funny little story real quick with it. I was working in a nursery. This was just literally right after fine foliage had just come out. And I haven't worked in a nursery since then, but this really stood out to me is this woman was standing over this table of these beautiful, beautiful Rogersia plants. And Rogersia is a, is a large, large palmate leaf and the new growth comes out the most exquisite cinnamon tones or kind of pinkish tones, depending on which one you're looking at. And she was standing there just with the most loving, exquisite gaze over these plants. And I came up to her and I said, uh, aren't those fabulous? And she said, yes, but I'm trying to mimic this combination that I saw in a book. And I said, oh, really? Do you have it with you? And she whips out a printout of the page from Fine Foliage. Oh, my <laughs> that, showed, that showed the combination of Rogersia and then the one of the Pierres that uh, Karen mentioned earlier, the Little Heath. Oh. And it's one of my favorite combinations ever. And I remember I just got a chill that went down my spine. You know, seeing that, oh my gosh, you know, here's uh, somebody else who likes something that I like too. And and it was a real full circle moment for, for both of us, actually, wow. <laughs> standing there yeah. in the nurse's. Yeah. Yeah. You're influencing plant choices. Is there anything better? Yeah. Not much. Not, not much. much. <laughs> Certainly, I'm not spending my free time at Nordstrom, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's always great when you can take a humble plant, a plant that is not even on their radar screen, like Regersia or Barrenwort or yeah. the Heath, and all of a sudden, you can help people fall in love with it. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's just showing how you can combine it with something else to show it off. That's exactly right. All right, let's do this one. A queen and her court. The list is, again, bright and colorful. The centerpiece in this, the queen, is a ruffled coral bell, which has a, a golden yellow leaf with really distinct red veins on it. And both those colors, the yellow and the reddish tone, are repeated or echoed by other plants. There's a, a golden sedge, an everillo golden sedge, which is actually an evergreen grass. And then there's a dark coral bell, the obsidian, uh, which brings out the red tones, albeit it's almost black in the obsidian leaf. But you'll notice from your own gardens and your own design work that if you have too much yellow and purple together, it's just a little too high contrast, a little too much. Yes. And so what we're also seeing in this is some good, solid, dark green leaves, um, both of a hellebore and of a, a primrose. And then the finishing touch here are the flowers on the primrose. Not yellow, as you might expect. That would be way too predictable. Um, this is a double white primrose, one of the sweetheart primroses. They're much more delicate. And that white adds a real freshness to the scene, which is otherwise, again, becoming a little too predictable. So that, again, it just, you know, as we've been coming back and talking about how we do our spotlight highlight limelight, this is just throwing in that party time. Just take it in a slightly different direction and you'll end it with something that's fun like this. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. So if we had to break this down, the spotlight would be... The electric coral bell. That, so that would be would the first be, one. You'd be looking at that and you'd okay. Be, okay, so I've got gold and I've got red. How am I going to highlight that? 
And you'd bring in the obsidian, that dark, dark purple, almost black leaf to highlight the red. You'd bring in the yellow grass to highlight the gold. And then you'd start to break it down by throwing in a bit of white would be the limelight. And Mm -hmm. the green just helps to soften things. And is the party time a challenge? Is that kind of your personal challenge? Like, what's the unexpected that I can do here? It, it is, and it's not to say that everything I design is that way. Sometimes, but I really enjoy doing monochromatic designs, you know, just staying, say, with a, with a blue, green, and, and creamy white combination. And just then my challenge is using um, unexpected textures, perhaps. So it's not that everything has, you know, just two colors, and then I throw in one that's not expected. I'll sometimes add a different type of plant or a different form than would be expected. Uh, but yes, that's really where I guess your creativity can shine when you get to the limelight part. <laughs> mm, I like that. You know, most people would think it would be the spotlight part, but it's actually the opposite. Right. Yeah, spotlight is really that the key observation piece. It's what am I seeing? What's my springboard here? I like it. All right, Christina, Fuss Free Drama is the title of the next composition. A neat one because it really is about having low maintenance and making things easy, but yet still having a lot of real impact in drama. And I think people sometimes feel intimidated that they can't have those two things, that they're too mutually exclusive. But this is such a great option for the later season, the winter, low maintenance, when you're really kind of noticing some of those smaller details. And this combination really shows that. It, it begins with the, the Bressing and Ruby Virginia, which is a, a beautiful, big, some people will call it like an elephant here. But Bressing and Ruby is wonderful because it, deer won't bother it, rabbits won't bother it. You can have it in a million different soil configurations. Shade, sun, I mean, it takes nearly everything, but Breastingham Ruby gets the most glorious, deep, beautiful red ruby tones in winter. And so it's an evergreen that changes color. And that's super valuable when you're talking about cold climate gardening, no matter where you live. And then we have it paired with one of my favorite plants, the Rainbow Lacoste. And so, or sometimes you'll see that listed as a setter bush. But it's a beautiful broadleaf evergreen with some marbling on it that's a cream and green. And then as the weather gets colder, it takes on all these beautiful rose and burgundy tones. And so you've got this small pointed leaf, more upright sort of arching and mountainous shrub that sits out over these low, broad, wide, elephant ear-like um, leaves of the burgundia. And then the thing that just absolutely finishes it off and just makes it sparkle and shine is this little silver leaf cyclamen. And it's got these just adorable little lilac orchid colored flowers on these little silver leaves that are just delicate, but they're hearty. You know, there's nothing fussy or frou-frou about this combination. These are all really hardcore plants. So it would be hard to ruin this. You know, for somebody who wants low maintenance, it's pretty ideal. Hard to ruin it. But I have to say, when I'm looking at it and I'm thinking about this particular combination, I think this is very sophisticated. I mean, I don't know that I would have put together something like this. I just, it's just very surprising, especially with cyclamen. It's not something I would think of. Well, I mean, you know, in winter, you know, you're looking at things in more detail and close up. So that's one thing. It's got to be someplace where you're really going to be able to enjoy it at that time when those cyclamen are blooming. But the other thing is, is I've ever seen somebody walk out of the house in an outfit that is so ridiculously simple, and yet they made it look so stylish and sophisticated. Yes. You know, that's this combination. Yeah. This is the, you know, the little French, you know, outfit that looks hard, but really isn't. And that's the secret to this combo. You're right. Oh, man, that's a great analogy. Yeah, that's really perfect for that one. Well, let's end with a winter romance. Well, this just shows what you can do in a very small container um, because this is a container design. There are several container designs in the book. This is a cobalt blue pot with a diameter only of about 12 inches. And yet in it, I've crammed seven plants. Um, Neither of us are known for our minimalist designs, and this is just one example of of that. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, and you'll see as I sort of talk through the colors that the color of the part is always a key component of the design. But I think the most striking plants in here are those with golden foliage. And there are three with golden foliage, which are set in a triangular formation in the pot so that your eye is moving around the design. And the tallest one is my absolute favorite golden conifer of all time. It's Forever Goldie. It's a golden arborvitae, which is hardy to zone three, so you can definitely grow it there. Super, super slender, um, and you can usually buy it in certainly a gallon size, sometimes a quart size, so great for container design, and then eventually put it out in the garden. I have one in my garden now, which is about eight feet tall. Um, but there's another little rounded golden conifer in there, and then there's a golden creeping jenny, you know, tumbling over the edge of this blue pot. And then to repeat the blue of the container itself, I've echoed that with a blue star juniper. Again, you can often get them in just little four-inch pot size. They're great for containers. And a tall, spiky blue grass uh, type plant. It's a juncus. And the romance part of this is I've added in some pink, pinky purple tones. Now, there are some flowers for the flower aficionados listening. Um, and what I've done is added in a heather. And again, it's not your average heather. This is a particular type of heather called a bud bloomer heather. And what's unique about these is that they're sterile, which means they're constantly trying to set seed. So they bloom for a much longer period of time because they never get to that point where they've set seed and they can rest. So this beautiful spikes of the magenta pink for a very long period of time on the green foliage. And then reinforcing those colors, there's a bugleweed in the foreground called Burgundy Glow, which has a, a marbled foliage that includes a, a slight cream and green, as well as some of that burgundy tint in there as well. So the whole composition is very simple. It's a year-round container that would be suitable. You know, you, there's just nothing you need to do with it. it. It's really quite delightful and very small. You know, you could put this in the smallest space on your porch and be able to enjoy it all through the winter. Give me a sense for the diameter of that pot in real life. It, it's 12 inches diameter. Yeah, oh I've goodness. still got that pot. I've had it for many years. I can see it as we're chatting now. It's 12 inches diameter probably about 10 inches tall. They're really very small. Wow. And Karen, I just have to say, there's something so delightful about hearing you say the words, cram those plants in that pot because <laughs> you sound so sophisticated with your accent. And then to have you say something like that, I'm like, what? What? What did she just say? I can't believe well, she you know said that, that. You know what the technical the technical term for that that we use is called cramscaping, guys. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Well, I tell you what, I think a lot of gardeners cramscape. Mm -hmm, absolutely. You went a little crazy at the nursery and now you come home and you have to address this and, and you were kind of forced into cramscaping sometimes. That's right. But That's um, right. yeah, I love this and I love the chartreuse. I just, I, the creeping Jenny too. I mean, any arrangement with creeping Jenny and my heart just melts, so... Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. And the other thing too, I have to say, I have a blue pot like this. So this is yeah. this is speaking to me. This will be something that I want to do. Well, ladies, I, I yeah, <laughs> oh man, I tell you, I cannot waste this opportunity to let two designers say goodbye to us without talking a little bit about the holidays and holiday containers and things that you guys have just kind of cultivated and designed throughout the years, things that you like to do in your own gardens or containers by your front door. Tell us everything. Give us the goods. What do you like to do during the holiday season? Well, um, you know, I, I there's a couple different tacks that I take on it. And it's a matter of whether you want to have something that's going to last beyond the holidays a combination of both or whether you just want something just purely for holiday alone. And so, for instance, the very last page in this book shows a, shows a combination called Contemporary Holiday, where it's a tall, narrow column pot and it's um, deep inset on a very contemporary porch. And so it's very low light. And so between the, the tall white container and the low light, I needed to keep it really light and bright for holiday nearby this front door. So I used 
three big, big birch branches that were about, I don't know, five to six foot tall. And I did them at different heights and then filled in with various greens and large overscale pine cones and ilex berries and yellow twig dogwood and whatnot. So it's very bright and colorful. But the thing, the takeaway from this is that right now at this client's house, She's taken everything out of this container except these giant white birch branches. And she's growing a plant up this now for actually a couple of years. And it's a plant called Fat Tetra. And I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a hybrid plant between a Fatsia shrub, which is a great big sort of tropical looking palmate leaf uh, evergreen shrub, and an ivy. And so it has these large palmate leaves. This particular one has cream margin around the edge. And it grows kind of like an ivy, but it's these large leaves like a faxia. And so it's winding up and through these white birch logs with this white creamy margin ivy in sort of an overscale dramatic fashion. And it looks so cool right now. It's awesome. So I'm always asking people what their ultimate end goal is. And a lot of them, because landscaping is expensive, are saying more often than not that we like plants in our winter and holiday containers that are going to carry us over maybe through winter and ultimately go out in the garden. And so in my design with my clients, I will use this often as an opportunity to maybe buy plants that are a little bit more expensive or a little bit special that we might not ordinarily budget for in the garden at other times. And so, for instance, you could have a beautiful hybrid coral maple. There's some new vine maple hybrids that are a very intense coral red. And you could have that in a pot with bright lime green hellebores and black mondo grass and bright chartreuse green mosses and have a really striking combination for holiday going forward that's going to look great going into even early spring and maybe later. Another thing that people are looking for is like collectors, conifers, for instance. They might save their pennies and use some of these fancier collectors, conifers to anchor containers and grow those on for a year or two or three or whatever it calls for in that pot. And then have something kind of like Karen was talking about with that beautiful Japanese maple in the pot earlier, where once it's big enough, then it goes out in the landscape and you're taking your dollar value investment in your plants and extending it much, much farther into the landscape than you might ordinarily. And then there's things just as what now might be considered ubiquitous using some of the Swiss chards, the bright red Swiss chard or the hot pink Swiss chards in some of the fall and winter containers as a, a good anchor plant. That's popular too. The Japanese maple paired with plants, little small evergreens like wintergreen. You know, somebody might have patches in their garden where they're trying to fill in wintergreen and make it very dense and thick, but they might not have wanted to spend the money to buy an entire flat of wintergreen. So we'll use them in the pot and use them continuously for a few years in a row. And then pretty soon you have that big, beautiful patch of wintergreen ground cover that you've always wanted in a space. So just depending on the take that a client has on what they're after, whether it's just purely seasonal or something that's going to extend the life of that pot further is one of the big defining factors in how I look at doing the containers for winter. Of course, then you have all the, you know, the fun elements. Like I just used beautiful red cardinals in one container and it was very eye-catching because you come around the corner on this street and the entryway where these giant containers were just draws your eye in with these beautiful little red cardinals. So there's all kinds of fun things you can do for winter. Well, and I love that you're thinking, you know, with your clients, you're helping them think about getting past Christmas, getting past the holidays and into January and February and March, which can also be a challenge in and of themselves. Right. Well, and and the thing of it is, too, is is as somebody who's either helping them create this design or installing it, I don't necessarily have time to come back right away after Christmas and (laughs) switch it out, you know, all the time. So it's buying me a little bit of time, too. But 
sometimes you get these happy accidents that happen when you let it be kind of like when Karen was talking earlier about the one with the eurygium and the curse, is that happy accidents when you let things go sometimes are the best. Absolutely. How about you, Karen? What do you like to do during the holiday season? And then how do you transition out of that? Well, my front door is a a gray blue and the containers flanking the door have in a blue toned conifer, which is there year round. They started off as gallon plants and were only about 15 inches tall and now about three feet tall. And so because I don't have the you know, summer annual trailers at this time of year, what I do to give me that drape over the edge is I go around the woods. As I said, I'm on acres here, so I've got all sorts of native trees I can go and cut. And I'll use, you know, cut cedar boughs and from the Douglas fir trees and just stick those into the soil and have those drape over the edge of the container to soften it. And then again, I also have holly growing on the property. So I'll cut boughs of evergreen holly, um, including some of my variegated varieties, and just push those into the soil and finish it off with a few Christmas decorations. I've got some nice glittery silver balls, which I will tuck into the soil, and maybe a few buried branches. And that will get me through the holidays. It's very easy after that when we reach to January, I just take out some of those more seasonal elements and I begin to add in things like the winter blooming hellebores and still staying with my color scheme and I can even still leave those cut evergreens draping around the edge. I might add in one of the hellebores, for example, like the cinnamon snow, which has this beautiful creamy white flower with a little pink blush on the reverse. Um, and that really freshens up the scene, all right? Took some primroses in there and just keep switching out those little bits and pieces until before I know it, I'm back around to summer again. I can throw away the cut branches onto the compost and go back in with sweet potato vine or whatever else I've decided I'm doing that year. Are there some things that you have incorporated into your landscape with the mindset that you will harvest them and use them during the holiday season? I have actually. um, And conifers are a great example of that, particularly some of the golden conifers, which I have, because it's very easy to discreetly cut little pieces of branches from, you know, right down at soil level. Well, nobody will ever see that you've taken a piece. In fact, I was doing that just for the Thanksgiving table. I was going around and cutting greens. And the Andromedas, the Pyrrhus we were talking about earlier, those are fantastic for using in the holiday containers or even in a cut flower arrangement um, for Thanksgiving time. And as you said, the hollies. I also have some contorted branches. I've got contorted hazel and some other contorted willow growing in the garden. So I have those nice twisty branches to use the design work. So yeah, it's surprising what you can actually go out and find. Seed heads, the Rebecca seed heads were still holding up at Thanksgiving. So they got pulled in. I don't think they'll last through till Christmas, but they did okay for Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> well, ladies, it has been a treat talking to you guys. And thanks to your book, Gardening with Foliage First. And if folks want to get a hold of this book, They can find it pretty much anywhere. But Karen, you're also selling it on your website. Do you want to tell folks where to find you and then what they can find once they get there? Sure. My business is Le Jardinet. um, And yes, that is a French spelling. Um, My business website is lejardinetdesigns.com. And if you forget that, you can simply type in Karen Chapman Gardening. and probably the first 30 hits. You'll find me. But right on there, you'll see a tab that says My Books. And there's a video that's got an interview I've just done on PBS recently where we're talking about how you can use um, our book to help you no matter where you live in the country, just as we've been chatting today. Um, Also excerpts from the book, some testimonials, and uh, links to go ahead and purchase. Thank you for that. And Christina, people can find you where online because you're also known as the personal garden coach. Correct. So Googling the personal garden coach is one very easy way. So people can find me, of course, at our blog. But if you go on Facebook, there's the personal garden coach. And then I also have a blog, the personal garden coach.wordpress.com. 
Well, and if people are fortunate enough to live in the Seattle area, they can probably get a hold of you and have you help them with their personal gardening needs. Yeah, I mean, I do consulting all over the country for garden centers as well. And so I'm traveling a lot and speaking all over too. So I'm getting around. (laughs) (laughs) Cheers to that, ladies. Cheers to that. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for all your time, ladies. This was really, really great. Thank you so much for having us. It's been real fun chatting with you. Thanks, we appreciate it. Thanks. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for our show today about how to create a foliage framework for your garden with Karen Chapman and Christina Solwitz. Talk about a good long conversation about garden design, plant combinations, and plant selections. That was fun. I hope today's show gave you a new approach to try when you're selecting plants at the garden center, when you're creating your gardens, and when you're evaluating what's working and what is not in your 2018 garden. Karen and Christina are pros. They've given us their very best advice to help us reset the way we think about what makes our gardens beautiful and the value of setting that framework with foliage first. And don't forget, you can find Karen and Christina's book on Amazon, Gardening with Foliage First, 127 Dazzling Combinations That Pair the beauty of leaves with flowers, bark, berries, and more. I just checked last night. It's selling for $16.96, and it's worth every penny. And if you're in the Facebook group, I provided a link there. You can certainly click on that and then go ahead and buy the book. You'll also help support the podcast that way as well. Just a reminder that the show notes for this episode will be under the Still Growing Podcast page over at my website at at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A.com. And don't forget, while you're there, you can click on the link for the Facebook group. It'll just say Facebook group at the top. And it's an easy way to join the listener community. I'm so thankful to my team over at Podfly Productions. I want to thank my editor and project manager, Eric Begay, and my copywriter, Ayn Kadena. I'd also like to thank the women who make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Beth Gardens in Illinois. She works at Griffin, a national brokerage firm, and one of the finest companies in horticultural service. And Beth is also a board member of the PPA, the Perennial Plant Association. Amy Von Atchen, Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine, Patricia Chandler Newport, Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan, Deb Gibson, and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann is the brand manager over at American Beauty's Native Plants, and she was featured back in episode 553, where we were talking all about how to incorporate more native plants into your 2018 garden. For my sign-off today, I leave you with this thought to help you grow. Sometimes the best place to start is the most obvious. Where are the places in your garden where foliage is not working? Instead of foliage first, where is foliage clashing? Where is it uninteresting? Where is it just plain bad or sad? Start there. Make a few changes. Move some plants around or out or escort them to the compost pile or over to a friend's house, someone who's just starting their garden. Putting foliage first is a skill, and you can get better at it with practice. So just get started. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Okay, personal challenge. Get segment one recorded in an hour so you can take the boys to their orthodontist appointment. Boom. I tell you what, you don't want to say foliage a lot because starts to sound a little weird. Foliage. Foliage.
I think it's the I. You know, if there was no I in there, it'd just be foliage. Boop. Foliage. Synonyms. Leaves. Leafage. Leafage. Who says leafage? Boop. One of the fun posts that got shared in the listener community this week was shared by listener Beth Engel. Oh, there goes my alarm. That's great. I love when that happens. No, I can't shut it off. Can we stop this? Let's learn how to... Oh, gosh. Seriously? One of the fun posts this week that got shared was by listener Beth Engel. (laughs) Are you kidding? And you want to check it out? Just type in peeper and this will pop right up. She uses midweight... Oh, gosh, I can't even speak. Also in the guest update segment, listener Lisa Chandler Newport. Really? Well, that's the garden news. Oh, gosh. In continuing ed, Mother Earth Living shared a post about growing dill in cilantro this spring. In cilantro? How about and cilantro? Jennifer. In continuing ed, Mother Earth News shared, no, Mother Earth Living, but Kimball Musk and fellow entrepreneur Tobias Peggs launched Square Roots, an urban farming incubator, an urban, oh my gosh, an urban farming incubator program, (laughs) an urban farming incubator program, an urban farming, oh my gosh, an urban Farming Incubator Program, an Urban Farming Incubator Program. Boy, that is not easy. In the Dream Guest segment, Civil Eats featured an article that was all about a farmer named Larry Kandarian. The title of it was called How a Grain and Legume Farmer Harvests Nutrition from the Soil. Okay, stop the press. Is it legume? 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 I'm about to find out. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. I'm not going to say it wrong. All in favor of legume? 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 Hmm. Let's see what it says. Pronounce legume? Hmm. Here we go. Legume or legume? Legume or legume? Nobody says that. Let me see. Let me hear that again. Legume or legume? Legume or legume? Legume. I think I'm going to say legume. 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 Okay. Got it. Boop. The title of it was called How a Grain and Legume. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Boop. And the title of it was called How a Grain and Legume Farmer. No, I wanted to say legume. Legume. Ugh. The chaff decomposes and fertilizes the legume crop. Oh my gosh. The chaff decomposes and fertilizes the legume crop. The legume the legume crop. The chaff decomposes and fertilizes the legume crop. The legume. <laughs> Help! I'm swimming in legumes. And just as wide. Yo. Well, there goes my alarm. That was helpful. Boop. The thing I like best about... Sorry. Boop. So there's a picture of... Let's see. What is this one? Doesn't say. Boop. There was also a great article... Oopsie. Boop. We had better find some quotables about foliage. Let's see if I can find some here. How about design and the human pursuit of that elusive, indefinable, there we go. It has a life of its own, an intricate, oops, sorry. This one's from Parallel Paths as designers and even writers They were true horticultural kindred spirits. So their collaboration, oh my gosh, emphasis on the wrong syllable. Come on, get it together. 